This video is brought to you in partnership with no one. There are no affiliate links, there are no paid promotions, there are no partnerships. This, the VPUB, is brought to you by the beautiful whiskey folk, the Aquavite Barflies, the dedicated Barflies and Aquavite patrons. I'll see you in a second. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to another Thursday night. Welcome to the VPUB. I hope you're all doing very, very well. It's amazing to see just how many of you are hanging about outside those doors waiting for things to kick off. It's always very, very reassuring to see everybody uh, excited to hang out for another couple of hours on a Thursday night for a bit of free time, a bit of a relaxing whiskey time. So welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, on the intro there, I was just kind of, there's a lot of things going on, on social media right now, and I think it's quite right. Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, whether things are paid for, whether things are um, traded, whether things are affiliate links, all of this kind of stuff. And we all have a responsibility, even apparently if you're a hobbyist, if you're an enthusiast or anything, and you're sharing content um, and you're, you're uh, in any way an influencer, then you have a responsibility to dis disclose things. And I think that that's only going to be uh, more and more of a thing going forward. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that topic tonight. I'm going to talk about it a, a little bit with patrons on Sunday night for the lock-in. And then next week, because I don't have a guest next week, it's just me flying solo back to solo again. Um, we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit, about um, how I've set up the channel um, and what my own take on that kind of activity is. Uh, but generally, everybody has a right to know when I talk about products, whether or not I've had it for free, never. <laughs> whether there is some kind of sponsorship or partnership, never. Um, and all of these things. I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with any other model, but that's not how I fund the VPUB. But we can talk about that at length next week. I have a guest in tonight. I'm excited in a few minutes' time to welcome uh, somebody from, uh, he's, in, he's located in Edinburgh, not from there originally, but he's a professional uh, whiskey buyer these days. But what come across when I was speaking to, to Arthur um, was this passion, <laughs> this really super lovely to listen to geeky passion about whiskey and whiskey's history and everything that affects his daily life, his job, and everything that affects his um, passions in whiskey as well. And quickly, the kind of quite small scale topics that we're talking about sharing on the VPUB together exploded into this much, much bigger thing. And I kind of reached out to him and said, do you know what? Come on the VPUB. Don't just talk about these little things. Talk about you. Talk about this everything that we're talking about. Let's explore all of these wee rabbit holes that we are falling down. So I'll get to uh, welcoming Arthur in a wee while and uh, have a nice time chatting to him. In the meantime, I'm going to drop into the lounge here and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies. So lovely to see you've broken 250 already. Let's see who's in this evening. Glenn, Dunk Glenn Dunklin, you star, is saying, good morning all. I will only see the first 30 minutes. We'll catch the replay. Glenn, I know you're down in Australia. Of course you are. He said, enjoy and lead on. Glenn, wonderful to welcome you in, my friend. I hope you have a great morning. Uh, Matthias Mulder is here. Good to see you, Matthias. Hell's with us here. Fantastic, Helen. Eric Cunliffe as well is also here in the background. Uh, and he's going to be dropping in to play a wee game of Is It a Space Side a bit later on in the stream as well. Daniel from Canada, Whiskey Throttle is here. You're the best guest, Aquavite. Am I the guest? <laughs> you, maybe we should have you on, Daniel. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Maybe you'd like to step forward and play along a wee game of Is It a Space Side or something in the future, Daniel. It'd be nice to see your happy face again, my friend. I hope you're keeping well. Uh, Graham Fraser is here. Good to see you, Graham. Cressamir is here. Wonderful. The Sniper King is in attendance. Uh, Jimmy Legg from Canada as well, Jean de la Cuisine, great to see you, John. Uh, Greg's Whiskey Guide in France.
Lance, Lee J. Brown, Lena Aaron, Callum Muir, Lindsay, Lindsay Holman, Marcus Kreitner. I did miss a super chat. I don't want to miss that. It's Cyclos Kerbango. I've mentioned your names a couple of times before. He said, any Japanese whiskey recommendations? Thanks, lad. Well, Japanese whiskey is quite topical right now because of the new tightening of the regulations that's come in as to what you can uh, label as Japanese whiskey, etc. I think we'll touch on that in a little while. Um, uh, Japanese whiskey is difficult to recommend. Um, I noticed that there's a there's a blend that's still freely available at a good price that I it would be tough for me to recommend it, but in the scale of Japanese whiskey, it is Japanese whiskey, and it's it's not too expensive. Suntory Toki, it's very spirit driven. It's quite young. It's very youthful, but still, it's nice to have a Japanese whiskey there. But you can still get your hands on things like Cheetah single grain, single grain, which is pretty decent. And if you're okay with non age statements, you can still buy the occasional Yamazakis, Hakushus, things like that. But there's not a lot of choice, certainly not in the UK, for Japanese whiskey. So I can understand, my friend, eh, why you're asking for recommendations. But cheers to you and thanks for the virtual dram. Um, Andrew Pierce is here. Good to see you, Andrew. Aaron Ed Edgerton, I think uh, that's not a new name, is it? He's saying, hi, Roy, from Brisbane, Australia. I know it must be very early in the morning for you as well. Aaron, it's wonderful to welcome you in, my friend. Nick is here, Whiskey 101. Good to see you, Nick. Kilko, Pete Head, Mark Slinger, Molasses. Good to see you, buddy. James McGoran, Stefan Novak over in Germany. Good to see you, Stefan. Ben Demon Hunter. Um, so, so many of you in. Tom Bueller Bells is saying, oh, just as it jumps, as it always does. Will I catch that comment, Tom? I'm so sorry. I think I've lost it now. There's so much chat coming in. Hopefully, I'll catch you a bit later in the stream, my friend. Sorry. Stuart S is saying, Roy, great to have you on uh, on the Japanese whiskey quiz. On Sunday night, I made a blunder. I was scheduling a lock-in for last Sunday night for with patrons. And then I worked out that it was, it, fortunately, it was me that worked out. I was lucky that I reminded myself that it was Valentine's night. So I had to push it out by a week. And Stuart, Stuart stepped up and uh, held for the barflies um, a Japanese whiskey quiz. And I was able to drop in and have a dram with them and uh, t take part in some of the questions. If you're interested in the, joining the barflies Facebook page, um, it's very active on Facebook, wonderful community, the nice kind of vibe and sense of inclusivity that exists in the channel here is very much alive in the Facebook page as well. You'll find it on Facebook under Aquavite Barflies. Somebody else bought me a dram as well. Uh, Querty Arvark, I think that's Daniel, isn't it? Um, he sent, have a dram for me, uh, and thanks for inspiring me to gather the courage to start a whiskey club with co-workers. That is amazing. So you've started your own whiskey club with co-workers. It might end up being something a wee bit bigger. You could have like a regional whiskey club out wherever you are. Thank you very much for uh, your drama friend and uh, best of luck with the whiskey evangelizing over there. Cheers, Daniel. When I say Daniel, I'm suddenly doubt doubting myself. Maybe it's not. I think it is. Whiskey Radar, Roland is here. He's saying, even Roy, nice to be able to join in again tonight. Uh, and as you're just talking about Japanese whiskey, I guess I'll pour a dram of Yuichi 12. Yuichi is still available here and there. Another good one. Uh, Daniel Gray is saying, enjoy that, Roland, and it's good to see you. And Daniel Gray is saying, Nika from the Barrel is a great Japanese dram, although interestingly, it apparently won't be eligible for this new branding, although they won't say what disqualified it. I think it's um, it's not difficult to kind of uh, extrapolate the fact that uh, there's at least some imported whiskey going to be in uh, Nika from the Barrel. It is a blended whiskey, though, so... Um, it, we don't necessarily know that it's all Scotch or all Canadian or all whatever. It's likely to be a blend. Tom Bueller Bells, there you are, Tom. A lot of Ben Nevis single malt in the future. <laughs> well, I don't think it's going to change that. I think there's still going to be a lot of Scotch bulk imported into Japan. It's not going to change that. What will change is just how they can label it. Will that affect sales? Not sure. It's something that they have to do, though. Scogs are the same as the Japanese whiskey drought, a temporary problem, or will it still persist in 10 to 15 years? It will not persist. It'll be in a different form, I guess, in 10 to 15 years. I don't have a crystal ball, of course. But I can tell you that it is very much a drought because uh, Japanese whiskey went hugely out of fashion. Mass and the distillery closures in Japan, the scale and the number of uh, distilleries that they had was much lower than, uh, than there's ever been in, in Scotland. Um, and a uh, Japanese whiskey was went hugely out of fashion and it wasn't until the kind of um, the premium market across the globe kicked off again and started to celebrate Japanese whiskey 
and domestically in Japan, the success of the highball, for example, kind of drove whiskey back into popular culture again. Um, and by that time, they didn't have any stock. They didn't have any mature stock and they sold it out quite quickly. Uh, a guy has bought me a dram, no comment or anything like that. Good, thank you very much for your drama, friend. You know, you can write a wee comment in there and uh, say anything to me, but I'll raise a glass in the meantime and I'll say thank you for your virtual dram. Cheers to you and uh, cheers to uh, uh, everyone for stepping up and enjoying uh, a wee bit of a uh, whiskey company tonight. Cheers. I have to tackle something. Um, I want to make mention of this. You might rem remember that last week uh, I talked about a friend, Brett, over in the States, Scotch Trooper, and I told, uh, I shared with everybody, so many of you know Scotch Trooper already through social media exploits and things, um, and just how big a uh, part of the community was for so many years, this, um, the whiskey community online. And I shared with everybody how much he was struggling and our thoughts were with him and his family. He passed shortly after the VPUB last week and word went out throughout Friday and the days after that. And uh, there's been an outpouring of uh, wonderful uh, memories and wishes um, shared throughout social media. I wanted to take a moment in the VPUB just to dedicate a quiet, silent minute for Scotch Trooper. I'm going to share a segment with you just here, a little collage of some of his Instagram posts and let people that perhaps don't know what he shared on social media, eh, some of his work that he shared uh, with us. While we do that, um, I'll ask you, you don't need to chat, just try and have a quiet minute thinking about Brett and fill the chat with hearts. If you're a barfly, you've got a whiskey heart, otherwise just use a regular heart. And uh, I'll share this moment with you just to give a Scotch Trooper a, a quiet minute. Thank you all. I'll raise this wee glass just to say, Brett, you inspired so many of us, but you'll be missed by us all. Scotch Trooper. Originally, there was a fundraiser for his treatment while he was going through treatment. Um, I know that that fund has been transferred over to a new fund and there's a new GoFundMe campaign for this very young family that I will paste in the, in the chat just now um, in the hope that anybody that's interested in, um, in donating, uh, actually it's going to be difficult for me to do that. Can I do it from here? It's better that I take the, the link from over here. Anybody that's uh, interested in donating uh, can make uh, a donation to help uh, Brett's young family. Um, if you're watching this on the replay, you'll find in the description box below, I've already put it in there, you will find uh, a link to that GoFundMe campaign as well. Thank you all for joining me in uh, raising a wee glass to Scotch Trooper. Um, 
Afterwards tonight, if you are picking this up on the replay, I will do my very, very best. My resolution for 2021 was to reply to every comment that's left. Um, of course, I can interact with the people live here tonight, but if you're watching on the replay, of course, I can't do that. But if you do leave a comment on the video, I've been very good this year so far and replying to all the comments underneath and interacting with you as much as I can. But also, hopefully, if I've done my homework well, you'll find that there is... Um, uh, chapter markers, there's timestamps in the description box as well, so that you can kind of go straight to the points that I talk about, whatever subject it may be with my guest, and help you navigate um, the couple of hours or more that the VPUB tends to take. Um, people have been pretty appreciative of that, and I can understand why. People uh, often probably click onto the VPUB and they see this kind of two, three hour content and wonder what the hell's going on. So I think it helps a wee bit uh, for those uh, timestamps just to take you straight to the, the content that you're interested in. But the big thing I have to keep reminding people about about the VPUB is the, the, is the idea is, is to try and create that atmosphere of all, of all getting us, of us all getting together in the pub and having just some quiet time and not really having to rush anything. If whiskey's taught me anything, it's taught me how to slow down. <laughs> So um, yes, if you're here live, relax. If you're picking up on the replay, it's ad free. Thanks to the barflies and the patrons that support the channel. There are no ads, it's not monetized. So you can skip in and out and never need to sit through ads as well. I want to raise a glass again and celebrate something cool. I want to uh, say a very, very happy birthday to one of the barflies that's out there. It's a very significant birthday. Uh, midnight tonight, uh, one of my friends is gonna turn 50 years old. One of my local friends here, uh, you'll know him as Roy Evans. I know him as Roy Evans as well, and Roy's Whiskey on Instagram. He's been a long-term barfly. He's a fellow member of the Glasgow Whiskey Club, and he's a lovely bloke. Lives very local to me as well, and he's peering over that precipice that is 50 years old. It's not nearly as hard a landing as you think, Roy. Yeah, I'll raise this wee glass, and I'll say many happy returns to you, my friend. I can't wait till I'm staring at you over the, the top of a glass of something nice. Happy birthday to you as I share this picture of you standing with the man himself, Ralphie. Cheers. Happy birthday, Roy Evans. That was a fantastic tasting in 2018. Ralphie brought along some cracking whiskies to share with us from his own collection as well for charity and shared some excellent anecdotes and stories as well. I can remember that we all had to get out. The tasting room was closed, the shop was closed, and we were all just hanging out and chatting and hanging out and chatting. And I can remember the staff at the Good Spirits Company in Glasgow physically having to kick us out. When I say us, of course, I mean me. <laughs> but it was an excellent, excellent night. Jimmy Legg is saying, all the cool kids are 53 years old. Got another couple of years to go before I get to be a cool kid then, J uh, uh, Jimmy. And he's also saying, I can tell you uh, what's going on. Fun is going on. Good to, always good to have you in, Jimmy Legg. And Mark is saying, timestamps are awesome in the replay. Aquavita, incredibly helpful last week for me. I appreciate it, Mark, and I know that uh, I'm getting a lot of good feedback. And I can see that people are using them as well. Gerben is saying, thank you for your comments. Gerben, thank you for your support. Whiskey Central is saying, I'm doing a live stream fundraiser for Scotch Trooper on February 27th at 5 p.m. USA. Yes, time, I will be giving away a couple of bottles to raise money. If you think I can help you with that fundraiser, Shayla, please reach out to me and I would be happy to help. Maybe I can donate a set of uh, challenge coins or something like that. The the original batch one and two, uh, as well as the, the, the most recent release, um, you can't get a hold of those and uh, it might help you raise a bit of funds. Actually, is in saying uh, 53 here too. Um, I, I wonder just how many of us are round about my age. It's always nice to see uh, when there's younger folk in as well. Neil Laverty is saying, sorry I'm late, Roy. Evening, whiskey folk. Um, nice, nice to have you in, Neil. And as I said uh, regularly, there's never, ever uh, a, a, anything like coming late to the VPUB. Um, yes, so happy birthday to my friend Roy. I hope he's doing well and I hope he's uh, he's famous for not opening bottles. Really is. He, he's he buys the whiskey, he loves having the whiskey, but he's very slow at opening them. He sent a picture to me early today and he only had five bottles open and on the go. So Roy, I hope you're opening something special and nice tonight. 
Roy, he's in. He's actually here. He's saying thank you so much. So now you need to tell us, Roy, what it is that you're actually planning and open to celebrate that day. Kevin Grant on Whiskey. Cousin Kevin is in saying what's in the glass tonight, Aquavite. I can tell you that right now I have quite a light and easy. Sometimes I enjoy this dram and other times not so much. It's somewhere in between tonight. This is a Bladnuck from Signature Vintage. Um, it's at 43%, but this is 20 years old. And a lot of the time I have this, you get a quite um, kind of slightly sour apple note. Um, but it's a nice, light, still quite tasty dram. And uh, I a perfect wee dram to enjoy tonight and just ease me into another couple of independents I've got. I mentioned the Good Spirits Company. I'm going to be pouring one of theirs. This is an Achroisk or an Athrusk. Uh, this is a nine-year-old Athrusk, 55.6% um, cast strength. I've had this quite a wee while and I do enjoy it. When I was uh, moving about uh, a section of the cabinet, I discovered this and I thought, wow, I thought I'd finished that. I was very happy to see it. And then a bit later on tonight, I'm going to have something a bit nicer. Uh, when Arthur's in, uh, I'm going to have, um, we haven't actually talked about actually uh, what kind of whiskies we're going to enjoy tonight, but that's a 25-year-old Imperial from the Single Malts of Scotland range. So let's uh, just get straight into it. Let's get my guest in tonight. Mark Slinger is saying, Roy, I wish I was only 50. Uh, do you know that? I keep getting reminded by people when I complain about my age, there's always kind of somebody a wee bit older that'll look at me and say, shut up and just enjoy the fact that you're the youngest that you're ever going to be. <laughs> um, Falsgraf is saying, I turned the 50 corner in 2022. You're close to there. Whiskey Games, Matt Bishop is saying, Roy, 51 is the new 41. I actually think that that's not just tongue-in-cheek joking. I seriously think that it is true. I think we're allowed to stay younger for longer these days. And long may that continue, Matt, don't you think? And Akshay is saying, I'm younger folk. Well, here's to that, Akshay. You, you're lucky, man. Good for you. And Mark Carell is saying, Roy, have you cracked that coquerent eight yet? I'm waiting on taste on a taster with bated breath. Uh, yeah, we talked about, you know, not chasing whiskey. And it, right after the, the, the V-Pub, you know, I went out the very next day and I chased the whiskey. Um, I had to wait till the afternoon because I had the kids here, obviously, homeschooling and everything. But in the afternoon, I went out and uh, I checked a uh, Good Spirits company in the West End that were out. I checked um, another West End store, Valhalla's Goat. And then eventually, I came into a Good Spirits company in the city centre and they, they still had a bottle. So I managed to get one there. Anybody that's opening that Coquera and and thinking that it's somehow going to be the same as the 2019 release is going to be potentially disappointed. It's a vastly different thing. The only thing that is the same is the fact that it's eight-year-old cast strength Kilcarran. Um, The cask is completely different. The flavor profile is completely different. What you're going to discover in the latest Kilcarran 8 is probably the closest I've tasted to that kind of traditional funky spring bank thing. So the, the, the sherry cask in it um, and the spring bank um, or sorry, the Campbelltown funk thing is there, which makes it play a little bit like a, a Springbank. So it's going to be the most Campbelltown y Coquerin release that we've had. There's a bit of dirtiness in it, a bit of savoury in there. There's something to get a bite into, and it might not play well for a lot of people. There's some people out there talking about uh, a slight sulfury notes on it and things. Um, I, I'm not overly sensitive to sulfur. I don't get much of it out of that coquerin 8. Probably for me it's coming across a wee bit more savoury so I can see why some people get it. Um, but I would say it's still excellent whiskey. It's £50. If you were able to get a bottle you're going to be very, very grateful that you've got it. But it is not the same prospect as the 2019 release. So if you're looking for more of that, you have to go to some friends that still have a bottle. You have to go trading or secondary or something. Jesse Voicing is in. Good to see you, Jesse. How often do you find a dram you like in its own pails when paired in a flight? Happened to me this week with Glen Scotia 15. Happens to me all the time. The, the whiskey changes dramatically when you're sipping it in contrast with something else. It's not always an improvement. Sometimes it gets a wee bit worse. Um, sometimes it gets a, a bit overpowered, a bit overshadowed by other things. But sometimes it's not even that. It's just the fact that something you're sipping it in contrast with can highlight new notes, strange notes, different things that you'd never picked up before. It's still a fun, fun thing to do, but it can happen that something you were enjoying in isolation is suddenly overshadowed in the lineup. 
but always give it a second chance, Jesse. Always give it another go. Uh, Evo, saying any thoughts on Toravek? I, I don't know. I don't have any. I'm hoping to get a hold of some. It'll depend on how many there are, how much of a, a rush there is for it. If there's a scrum, if there's a mess for it, um, I'm just going to step back. I do have a friend who's suggested that um, uh, he is going to potentially be able to get me a hold of one too. Uh, if he can, then fantastic. If not, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm curious though. I would like to taste it. So even if I don't get a bottle, I'm, I'm likely to get a sample, all right? Dave Cummins is absolutely correct, saying there will always be more whiskey. You're absolutely right. And Willie Dollar is saying, Kevin Grant on whiskey, just sipping along, listening to Aqua Vitae, the young whippersnapper. Kevin Grant is the is the whippersnapper, definitely. Uh, despite his new career, he's still putting whiskey content out there on, on YouTube as well. So Kevin Grant on whiskey, if you click on his name, he's just commented recently, you'll be able to click through and see the channel that's been shared, sorry, the content that's been shared by Cousin Kevin on YouTube as well, whiskey content. And Evo, I <laughs> say, Aquavita, if I manage to grab one, I'll send you a sample. Evo, th thank you so much for your generosity. So my guest tonight is Arthur Mortley. Um, I'll tell you a wee story about Arthur. Uh, I was 2018, I think it was 2018, I was at a master class in the Olden Rare, and it was a wonderful tasting. I mean, really a wonderful tasting. It was an SMWS-themed thing. Um, and the opening dram, the opening salvo for this master class, I kid you not, it was 1.1. Was the first ever release from SMWS. So one is Glenn Farkless, the distillery, and dot one is the first ever cask that they'd released from that distillery. Quite amazing to be able to taste that. Um, an amazing experience. Uh, Sukinder Singh was there, Charlie McLean uh, was there, lots of people, and, and Arthur was there. And the reason I remember he was there is that we were talking about Kalila at one point, and Arthur said something um, that really resonated with me, and it's something you've heard me repeat since on this channel, and that is, thank God for Kalila. That was his words. And it resonated with me because at the time I was struck by how consistent Kalila was, how it was available to us everywhere, how there wasn't any kind of singing or dancing or parade about it. It was just like that reliable, solid friend that was always just there. And how amazing it must be that that distillery is there on that little island to do so much heavy lifting, to free up so much capacity in other island distilleries to let them have a bit more flexibility in things. But despite it being that big factory on Isla, we've talked about it often on the channel, that it's that kind of solid, consistent product that comes from it. I mean, if I don't recall ever having a Kalila that I didn't really enjoy. It's just, it's it's almost like, you know, it, 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 it's so consistent and so reliable that you can just almost buy it blind from independence, official bottles, wherever it is, you're never going to be really disappointed. And Arthur said, thank God for Kalila, and it stuck with me since. When I reached out to Arthur to speak to him about the VPUB and what we do here, it was because he was starting this new project and I was really interested in it. I was really curious and I was struck by it. And then we started to talk about other things. We started to talk about how he got into whiskey and we ended up all over the whiskey landscape talking about all these things and I said okay I tell you Arthur what come on the v-pub hang out with me and the story will be let's just talk about Arthur Motley let's talk about what we're talking about now and I guarantee you that people will enjoy listening in um, eventually I convinced them to come on and talk about these things and I convinced them to come on under the title of the whiskey buyer and I'd like to reach out to my friend if he's in good shape to come on Arthur Motley and wel welcome, Arthur, behind the bar at the V-Pub. Good evening, my friend. It's really great to welcome you in. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for having me. And, uh, How are you? Everyone. Well? Really well, yeah, yeah. Another another long day. It's relentless at the moment, but in a good way. Um, and I'm glad to be just sitting and relaxing in front of the fire and having a drink. As long as you are relaxing, that's the whole point of oh, it, yeah, it's yeah. relaxing. You did message me halfway through the day to say, I I'm going, I'm, I've am i taken a half day today to relax and things, so I'm fresh for tonight. And then you admitted that being the workaholic that you are, you just ended up working through the day anyway. You're not too tired. You're feeling pretty fresh, right? No, no, I'm looking forward to it. Lots to talk about. Do you remember that tasting I just mentioned? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember saying thank God for Kalina, but I have said it a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, I do, I do genuinely believe it, and it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? There's no, there's no 
wild expectation with the Kaliba. You, know, you try a new Lagavulin and you're like, ah. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and, and sometimes, not necessarily Lagavulin, but if you've got that kind of amped up anticipation, you, you, may, you could be disappointed. You're never disappointed with Kaliba. It's always good to excellent. Absolutely. And it's, it gets to the point where you, you know what you're getting into. When you, when you approach a Kalila, you know you're just going to have this really solid, good experience. Everybody always tries Kalila and they go, oh, it's, it's always good, isn't it? It's always good. It's always pretty well priced as well. Most of the time, they've always got a decent price associated with them. And it doesn't matter if you're buying it as a branded uh, Kalila product, if you're buying it from an India's Kalila, or if you're buying it from another producer under a kind of branded theme like maybe it's going to be a Port Askig or a Finlagen or a whatever it's going to be. It just whatever way you consume it, it seems to be reliable, like that kind of solid, reliable friend, right? So I remember you saying that, and it kind of resonated with me. Um, and I'm glad I remembered it, and, uh, and, and I'm glad you remember being there as well. But do you remember tasting that 1.1 Glen Farkless too? Yeah, I'd always wanted to try it. And I, uh, I bought a bottle along, something that I'd bottled there, a Japanese whiskey, I think it was, Yurichi from the first batch. It was an amazing tasting. But the 1.1 was incredible because it was young in terms of age statement, but it was so good. It was such a good whiskey. Really and it's good. amplified by the ceremony of being able to try 1.1 in yeah. that environment with, uh, you know, this kind of hushed atmosphere of, everybody just paying attention to the privilege that they're about to enjoy. Mm. I mean, it's very small pores. It had to spread out a long way, of course. Sure. But, I mean, when would that have been bottled? 1.1, was that 83 or something? Or? I think it's 83. I, I should know my SMWS history a bit better, but it's been quite a long time since I worked there. And some of it started to fade. I used to know it off power. But I think 83. If you'd asked me to guess, I would have said 83. 83. Well, that's a good segue in when you talk about SMWS and you should know your history. Let's talk. Let's ask a wee <laughs> bit about Arthur Motley. Um, you didn't have any designs on getting into whiskey, and yet here you are two decades in. Professional mm. whiskey buyer now, director at Royal Mill Whiskies, and obviously drink mongers under that umbrella as well. Mm. But let's go back. To 20 years ago, where was Arthur Motley and how did you end up uh, getting into whiskey? How did you end up here with hanging out with me tonight, Arthur? Well, I was kind of limping over the finish line of doing a degree in Edinburgh, um, actually in archaeology, but I'd already decided that I was going to go off and do something else, um, much as it was interesting, the career in archaeology. Ar archaeology. That's yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah, it, but the, the career there is pretty brutal. Um, in terms of earning a decent wage and, and making a name for yourself, whatever. I decided that that wasn't for me and I'd kind of actually lined up a bit of a career working in, well, I'd hoped it would turn into a career in sports, sports television. I'd worked at a, a World Cup and I wanted that's what, and my design was to learn Japanese and go to the Japan Korea World Cup, which would have been 2002, I think it was, wouldn't it? That's right, yeah. absolutely, yeah. 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 Anyway, the week... <laughs> I graduated, um, someone in the office left, and that person did absolutely everything. Sorry, I should have said, my last year at university, I, um, I took a bar job at SMWS. My Work friend, yeah, yeah, my friend had done that for a year, and I'd gone along a few times, really liked the place. I mean, the vaults is amazing. Um, and um, he, he left, Edinburgh, and he said, you could have my job if you wanted. And I had one year left of studying, and I thought, well, that would just be amazing. I'll be leaving Scotland probably forever, much as I loved it, and I could spend that last year learning about whiskey and really, really learning about it. And I could leave Scotland with that skill. Um, did it, absolutely loved it, and just got so into not just the drink, and learning about a bit about the history, but also the culture and the uh, the people who came into the place and the questions they asked and what they were passionate about. And, and go, I went to all the tasting panels, so uh, as many as I could. And so I sat next to Charlie McLean and these old retired blenders, some really interesting characters. Um, I just loved it and I was just having fun, but that was it. And then the week I graduated, someone in the office left, there's a, a lady called Kate Brown, and she did everything in that back office, absolutely everything, including buying the whiskey. Suddenly left, 
didn't want to work there anymore for whatever reason. And so the managing director came through to the bar and said, um, do you fancy having a job being a whiskey buyer? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> and so- No experience you know, required. <laughs> well, he'd obviously watched me being really, just getting it, you know, just, yeah. you, you get whiskey. Loads of people kind of just get whiskey and he could see my love of it. And he gave me that opportunity. They needed to reorganize things quickly. And it was a, it was a kind of weird role because it was kind of junior and I was learning the role, but at the same time, I was buying all the casts of whiskey for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society for about two and a half, three years. And from then, I just was like, okay, that, that, that job, that career exists, a whiskey buyer, and it's the only proper job I've had, if you can call it a proper job. Uh, well, you can call it a proper <laughs> job, but I, I, from your statement, from even you just saying that there, that's you uh, implying quite rightly, I guess, that you, you do kind of pinch yourself a wee bit and you're very happy to be in the environment of whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes it's been a grind. Sometimes there's really tough days. There's a lot of spreadsheets. Yeah. There's a lot of emails, but it's it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. It's an amazing industry. It's an amazing drink. It's a great culture. Um, it's something I care about a lot. So going, so going from bulk buying casks then, you then mm. move across to Royal Mail whiskies. so you come into the retail sphere. And, and as you've put it, you, that interface between the producer and the consumer, you know, the, the end uh, consumer of the product, there's maybe a contrast there. But in both roles, whiskey buying was what it was about. So there's going to be a difference between buying for an independent for SMWS and buying for a retail chain, right? Oh, hugely different. So I guess we can come on to retail a bit a, a bit later, but that was the first thing I kind of had to learn how you buy bulk whiskey, casks of whiskey, which is, a, it still is a weird system. Then it was kind of even weirder and antiquated and kind of old gents doing deals in the urinals off the golf course kind of thing and swapping up, you know, swapping a hundred cars, swapping a 50 car, you know, 50 cars. Right? And there were loads of old guys who really looked after me and, um, and were excited actually because someone young was coming into whiskey. And it seems weird to say it, but there were not that many jobs in whiskey. The brand ambassador role didn't really exist. And there was a genuine concern that whiskey drinkers were getting old and dying and no new people were coming to the category. So people were really helpful because I was young and interested in whiskey and, and they gave me huge amounts of knowledge. So anyway, yeah, learning this weird system, which I was buying single malt as many independent bottlers are now also, but that entire system of cask sale only existed to grease the oils of the machine of blended whiskey. Yeah. I think that's changed. I think we've, we've started to have that cultural shift now as, as the power of, of single malt kind of marches forward. But it was back in the fact packet stuff. And it was everything cost X pounds per year per litre regauge, no matter what it was. And then slowly you started to see things like McCallum kind of creep up, creep up and people paid a bit more of a premium for that. But it was, it was this uh, pressure valve to release the needs of the blenders, shortfall or excess. And there yeah. needed to be this way to put stuff in, but it wasn't economic at all. And prices had barely changed for a decade, for 20 years, 15 yeah. years, probably fair enough. And it had been the same prices all the way through because they had too much whiskey and it yeah. wasn't based on what it cost to make. And, and it was far too cheap in those days. And I do yeah. remember that first time looking down and going, you know, with my little calculator the first time, thinking, am I really young or stupid here? Am I doing these sums wrong? Or is this worth whiskey apparently worth absolutely nothing? <laughs> yeah. And, Tax, and it, that was... <laughs> that's right. And, and what's, so you're kind of, you're cask trading mm. as the whiskey lock is emptying then. And you were, you were, you were buying these casks back at a time where, okay, SMWS existed. There were other independent bottlers out there. Um, mm -hmm. There were a few core range of single malts and more coming all the time, but not really the 
that concept of a boom, a premium boom, a malt boom, whatever you want to call it, hadn't really dawned yet. So you're looking at these really, really cheap prices and thinking, why would anybody distill whiskey if after 20 years it's only worth this? Is that what you're thinking about when you're buying in your calculator there? Yeah, well, yeah, basically. It, it, it just, I, I wish I had acted on my instincts a little bit more and got my yeah. dad to sell his house, sell his pub, sell everything. Back, back then. And buy, <laughs> buy this ridiculously cheap whiskey. But then slowly towards my end, end of the time of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, which was, I mean, it was probably a pretty crucial time because um, I felt the change even in that only two and a half, three years. Suddenly, you couldn't really get the Freud anymore. You certainly couldn't get McCallum. Someone came in from McCallum to tell us that, you know, we'll, that, that will never happen again. You know, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society selling McCallum, number 24 right. or other. And yeah. slowly the, th the avenues um, kind of closed down a bit and some of the prices went up a little bit. And Kalila was one of the few smoky whiskies you could get by the end of it as smoky whiskey became really scarce. So it, it was already changing greatly then. And of course, we imported the first cast of Japanese whiskey, and that felt risky, bold, imaginative. It wasn't my decision, I should say. I kind of administered it more. It was a, that was a big thing. Um, but um, they had won one award, the best of the best for Whiskey Magazine. And then that was kind of the next big feather in their cap, in their, in their eyes, that Scotch Malt Whiskey Society had bottled your yep. whiskey. And Takatsuru's son, adopted son, came over, and so I met him briefly. And it was amazing, wow. really amazing time, really amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you talk about that peated whiskey thing again, when I first got into whiskey around about the mid two thousands, I went into a shop in Edinburgh to buy a bottle of Lagavulin and sixteen back then, and it was sold out because Lagavulin and sixteen was an allocation. And this is the mid. 2000s, 2005, 2006, something along that order. Um, so that was probably a time that that it was maybe just coming into being in demand again, and, and Lagavulin was under pressure to provide blending stock, perhaps out there. And it's kind of funny when you look back on that now to see that when we talk about these these uh, dynamics in Scotch whisky, we realise how young a thing malt whiskey is mm -hmm. if we went and if i walk into your shop now one of your shops now and see the range of single malts that's available just now you almost especially if you're coming into the scene as a, as a new a newbie if you like you see all that whiskey you, it's difficult to know where to start it's just it, it's almost overwhelming that's only about 15 or 20 years old right that that selection yeah yeah well key is uh, uh, Jumping forward a bit to, to all my whiskies, Keir, who, who kind of founded the business as we know it, there was a shop there before, but he, he turned it into whiskey specialist. You know, he bought everything. <laughs> he bought everything he could find to, to fill those shelves. Um, and now buying everything is certainly not possible, uh, not for the consumer and not for the retailer. We have to be much more selective. So, uh, yeah, ranges, the modern type of mar modern marketing we see now, it, it was so different. So very, very different. It wasn't so, I mean, popular. It wasn't, it wasn't popular. It wasn't doing well. That's the way people spoke about whiskey um, around 2000, 2001 within the industry. They were worried. It didn't seem to be doing very well. People forget that. So blends, we see blends not kind of get some, some, some years it's up, mostly it's down. Single malt is creeping away, creeping away, but, but we've no idea how long it's going to keep doing that or how long it's going to be a nervousness what's the, what's the feeling and i'm not i don't want you to skip ahead because we're kind of going to go through uh, sure. the evolution of your career but what's the feeling by contrast in the industry now uh ooh. um i mean pretty good and it's funny this news that just came out recently was it the Diageo's results were eight percent down or something like that and there's lots of people kind of jumping on that kind of sort of see the whiskey lock see that they've made the mistakes. But I mean, we have had all the bars and restaurants shut for most of the year. And that was a major, major part of, Absolutely. of their business. Yep. They gave a huge amount of focus. And it has been consistent growth for a very long time. It's got this whole best of times, worst of times 
vibe about it, I think, the industry at the moment. Like, it is incredible in some sense, the prices that are being achieved for it. But at the same time, there's a worry, there's a nervousness. Um, I think there's, there's um, it feels like something's about to go badly wrong at times, <laughs> but maybe that's just my negativity. Um, well, I, th I think it's also, you know, optim optimism or, sorry, pessimism never leads to disappointment. So that idea that we've seen what's happened in the past, we saw the, you know, the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, the Pattisons, we saw prohibition having a, an effect. Um, you know, we saw um, struggles in the past. We saw the post-war boom, at, you know, the distilleries opening right across the landscape, and then it suddenly fell out of fashion in the late 70s, and we, we end up in the... So we've, through the whiskey lock and things like that, we've seen these things happen in the past. However, nothing like what we're experiencing now has existed before. People buying single malt for single malt's sake people collecting, people being really, really, um, and I'm talking about on a huge scale, people being really, really knowledgeable about the product, you know, down to the, the minutiae of everything, production, barley, yeast, I mean, it's crazy. I, I think that that's got a lot to do with the technology age that we're in just now, that ability to share information, that democratized information, and we can share it so easily. Um, I talk about, you know, we're even at a stage that there are idiots on YouTube evangelizing about how great whiskey is. And there's an inevitability that it's all, we're all playing a little part in this kind of uh, building something that I think deserves to be celebrated and talked about. Do you think that this boom that we're seeing now is different from the previous booms that I've summarized? Well, Patterson's in that. Mean, Patterson's, the, the post-war boom and, 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 and crash that came. Yeah, because there's a lot more people to begin with, and I think it's driven by the internet and, the, and all, you know, the, the time scale that I'm talking about is the internet. And as you say, democratization Sorry, of information. I didn't hear what you said. That was my watch. <laughs> <Just wondering to I'll, laughs> I'll speak up, watch. Um, <laughs> um, Sorry. I'm just going to throw yeah. it across the room. I think I don't, I don't know. She doesn't listen to me, but she listens to you in English accent. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. I think we've seen that the, those videos of Scots trying to off, operate lifts, haven't we? Um, eleven, yes, <laughs> yeah, eleven, yeah. Um, the, the period that we're talking about is ma matches the internet and it, this democratization of information and the industry can run around slapping itself on the back if it wants, but. I think it's been a people's, you know, the, the, the role that people themselves, the whiskey culture themselves have played by the way they have spoken to each other, networked with each other, decided what is good. Decide. Um, I think yeah. in, in the lead up to this, you were talking about this outsider feeling um, and, and feeling like an outsider, which to some degree is a young lad meeting all these guys um, very older than me and buying all this whiskey, I did feel like an outsider and I did have to blag it for some period of time. Yep. But I think it's understated how much the non-industry has contributed to the whiskey industry. And you look where we are now and, and a lot of the huge discoveries about whiskey and its nature have come from the public and not from the industry or from industry sanctioned writers even though there are many great ones um but you know you look at who is the most influential person in whiskey today maybe dave brew probably serge valentine yeah not professional an outsider and uh, and i think there's been so many and it's grown on so many you know on such a small base malt's l list you probably won't remember that one that was an email no. chain that you signed up for uh, this is in Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and if you got added to the list, if you sent an email, it got sent to everyone. And this was hugely influential right at the beginning. That's when people, I first started yeah. hearing people talk about old bottle effect. The fact that the industry wasn't telling the truth about the fact that bottles changed over time, sealed. Yes. Uh, the early 80s um, perfumed Beaumors. Now, that yeah. was a discovery by people, not by consumers. And it was yeah. shared in little weird cells all around the world, of whiskey clubs. And then suddenly they were all brought together by the internet. 
and forums yeah. like whiskey 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 or malt maniacs and yeah. and and so huge contributions from non-industry specialists when, when i got into whiskey i ended up consuming my whiskey knowledge through books traditional ways but also through malt maniacs whiskey fun serge valentine of course um, I've been able to thank Serge for what he what he was able to provide. Obviously, his language was way, way, way ahead of where I was back then. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, whiskey, whiskey, whiskey. Mark Connolly's forum, um, mm -hmm. uh, those those kind of internet forums and things like that. As as you are in your retail role, can you what kind of effect did you see? Say Willie Dollier has asked here. He's asking what kind of changes that you've seen in the retail landscape during that time. If you're living through this period, you must see it. It must be quite an incremental change, but you must you must be aware of it. You must see it happening in front of your eyes almost. Yeah, kind of in front of your eyes. There's a, there's a few shocking moments that kind of have happened throughout the, my career that you're like, it's literally in one meeting where you go, right, okay, so it's all different now. But, but Give more, us an example if you've got any. That would be... Uh, what am I thinking of here? Um, it's potentially diff different releases, like maybe when McCallum came out with Fine and Rare yep. um, and came to us and offered us really poor margin. I mean, that's boring for the viewers, but um, really poor margin, but incredible prices selling by one single bottle. And uh, same with Dalmore Constellation. You know, someone yep. coming into the meeting and saying, we're charging you this and we expect the consumer to charge this. And we're just... You know, it's eye-popping stuff. And yeah. in fact, both those opportunities, we refused. Um, probably yeah. lost hundreds of thousands of pounds, but it just felt wrong. It just felt like yeah. the wrong path for the direction, for the industry, you know, to go down. So there's, there's things like that. Or you just suddenly notice how much things have changed. So maybe for the first five to eight years probably of buying for Royal Mile whiskies. So as a retailer, so we're, we do our own bottlings here and there, but um, we're mostly buying bottled stock, cases of bottled stock at a wholesale price and putting a fair yeah. fixed margin up and selling it. That's retailing. And for the first five to eight years, you know, after a year, someone would come in and they'd say, they've already got a 12 year old and they're bringing out an 18 year old. And I'd, pretty much be able to tell them before they'd said what the cost price would be and what the retail price would be because there were these very fixed strategies yeah not based i should say on what it costs to make they've never gone back 18 years ago and worked out what that thing cost to make isn't that sure. a bit weird isn't that yes. a bit odd <laughs> um anyway we'll leave that bit to one side then after a period of time they're coming in and i'm thinking right okay you're going to need to try and work out what you think it's worth before they say it. It's a good thing for a buyer to do because then you're not influencing their price seems reasonable or whatever. I don't know. So I, I would always try and do that. Okay, they've got an 18-year-old. It's going to cost 55 quid retail probably. Yep. But I'd have to start guessing because suddenly you were starting to get some weird prices coming out. Now someone walks through the door, and honestly, Roy, I've not got a bloody idea what they're going to say. They think their whiskey's worse. I mean, like literally, I, I've been doing it longer and longer and longer. And there's, you know, there are people who've been doing it as long as me, and there's some people who've been doing it as long as me. But you know, you know not to be surprised, and yet you continually end up surprised, right? I've got no bloody idea. <laughs> <laughs> so that that is one thing that has certainly changed, and consumer consumer behaviour is unrecognisable now as well. Um, the way people are forced to have to buy whiskey in in such, you know, bloodthirsty competition with each other is has changed, and that, that's a big shift. Um, probably, you could put that down to probably around two thousand nine, two thousand ten. So there was a bit of whiskey resold on eBay, then they stopped doing that, and then you got professionalised whiskey auctions, and then professionalised buyers selling directly into auctions or even the auction houses themselves buying to sell on their own auctions and then suddenly the the competition is, is vastly different i'm going to ask you more about that in a little moment because yeah, it's very right, interesting right, right. and it's very on topic with a general themes that's kind of ongoing in the in the vpub week by week generally uh, whiskey central shayla is, is having a laugh at me and they 
my watch speaking back to me. Blair Stevenson is saying, it can't hang out tonight. We're watching the replay, just dropping in to say hi to you all. Blair, it's always a pleasure to have you in live or on the replay, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Dirty Dog is saying, Roy, your watch is set for 1984. I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. That's what's going on. It's just, I don't know why it's happening. It doesn't seem to make much sense. I need to find a way to just, I can't even say her name, switch her off completely. Actually, I can say her name because she doesn't respond to me. Uh, uh, Kim Grant is saying, does Arthur see a change in buyer's market for cast strength whiskey compared to whiskey at 40 to 46 ABV. I think we can touch on that when we talk about the behaviour um, of, of the consumer now because they're more knowledgeable, because they're much more likely to be enthusiasts and things. Are they kind of going uh, up, up in ABV and things like that? I think there's an obvious answer to that, yes. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's a consumer-driven change, uh, to use a slightly, you know, the whiskey fans have demanded that and slowly in in many cases it started to happen and in turn that has been driven by the independent bottlers you know a single cask is great all well and good but i like 46 percent and above you know that's yeah that's a change driven by the independent bottlers people like the scotch malt whiskey society and then the industry some of them finally taking the switch some of them not. Uh-huh. And then people in the industry that were willing to step up and say, there is an appreciable difference mm. if we don't filter it, if we put it out there fuller flavoured at a slightly higher ABV, um, the, you know, these more natural presentations, the people that, that stepped up um, and, and, and were declared, I'm thinking about Billy Walker, and Billy Walker was on the VPUB last year, I'm thinking about a gentleman that's joining me in coming weeks, Ian, uh, Ian McMillan, these people that were kind of, that were keen to push that as being even a possibility for single malt, because I think single malt, when it, if you look at the Glenfiddichs of the 60s, uh, the Glenlivets of the late 60s into the 70s, and everything else that followed on the back of that, Glenmorangies and McAllens eventually, they were all presented the exact same way that blends had been presented for 100 years. 40% ABV, 43 export strength, uh, coloured for consistency. They were just picking up exactly where the blended market had left off without any concept of the fact this is a single malt. And by nature, it's going to vary. And brand variation, sorry, batch variation should maybe even be explored and be embraced like it is in wine or any other organic product. But whiskey's got another hurdle to pass, hasn't it, where it gets placed inside an organic vessel to mature. So I, I think but I think you're right, the point that you make about that information share about the internet allowing that message to spread came along at the right time where there were people with the appetite and and in a position to be able to satisfy that consumer demand, independent bottlers. Um extended, more naturally presented whiskey ranges from traditional uh, ranges from traditional producers. Um, that's interesting. Uh, Kevin Bryant is saying, I like a bourbon and rye, but I feel there is a bourbon bubble that will burst, maybe not whiskey though. I think that there's so many markets around the world, Kevin, that are playing catch up. Um, we, you look at the communities that are growing, the more and more people that discover whiskey, is that whiskey has a way of getting its claws into people. And it's not in a hurry to let people go. And I think if the community continues to grow, there's no reason why that bubble should burst for, for the type of uh, bourbons and rice that you're talking about. Querty Arbark is saying, go ahead. Well, I didn't hear the gent's name. What did you say his name was? Uh, Kevin Bryant, Kevin. 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 Yeah, I, I would just say that bourbon has a fantastic advantage. It is ready at three, four, five years old you know it's very ready to drink at that age yeah and if so they have the opportunity to price it affordably like if you're talking about this 70 80 well over here 70 80 pound 100 pound bourbon bubble then yeah there may not be legs in that but they've got an amazing opportunity in bourbon three four five year old delicious really good whiskey that should taste like that and does taste like that so they should be able to keep things ticking along quite nicely and provide a really good, affordable whiskey. A broad brush statement would be to say that, you know, very mature bourbon is entry level scotch, 10 or 12 years or something, right? It's Well, it's too old, for my opinion, like, and, and people are overpaying because very few are still good at 10 or 12 years old. That's too much old. I remember, 
I remember Van Winkle coming to Whiskey Fringe and who, was it Julian Van Winkle and his wife, Flossie, I think it was, Van Winkle, used to okay. come to Whiskey Fringe every year and they used to love coming to Scotland and they paid for a table and they would come every year work incredibly hard. They would sign these beautiful books um, and at the end of it, and we'd have 10, 12, 15, 20 and 23 Van Winkle on the table and we'd be selling it. And at the end, they'd ask how many of it sold and we we're like, yeah. It's really embarrassing because it, it, it wouldn't sell. They couldn't sell it. They could not sell it. And they tried so hard. They were so charming, but people were not interested. <sighs> it's incredible. Incredible. And we need, the Scotch whiskey industry needs bourbon to keep going. <laughs> we need the casks, right? We need the... <laughs> We need it to, to we need it to be a, a global a success. <laughs> um, and who, whose comment did I miss there? I was just about to read. Matthias is saying when I hear uh, that that bottles like Rosebank or St Magdalen rare malts were sold for eighty pounds fifteen years ago, it actually hurts. You might remember Ralphie when he was on the podcast with uh, Rob and Jeremy over at uh, Whiskey Rant podcast. Ralphie was the, uh, talking about walking through the West End of Glasgow, and there was a, a shelf. And a, and a window creaking under the strain of rare malts, all being sold sub a hundred pounds. Uh -huh, but the, we're not. Uh, the rare uh, malt series was also seen as a failure. Um, they couldn't shift it; they were discounting it to us. It's incredible, incredible. I mean, we're talking about Melbourne's, Lady Burns, um, Convo Moors, things that are just. Um, uh -huh, but we don't have time machines, and the focus on the channel. It's nice to kind of acknowledge history and 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 to take information and understanding from that but i think it's we need to focus on now because that's actually teaching us what was being walked past what was failing what wasn't succeeding because there was a lack of understanding a lack of appreciation we don't need to suffer from that today there are things out there today now that we're not going to be able to get our hands on next year a few years down the line and we'll be looking back on today saying remember when we could and i think that it would be nice to kind of focus on where we are just now sometimes just take a bit of kind of uh, mindfulness about it matthias is saying uh, that was matthias's question that I picked up there and eric is asking what a treat having arthur on to share his unique perspective of the back side of the industry and that's two <laughs> words <laughs> it's an interesting turn of phrase there eric <laughs> I'll need I need a few more drafts before that happens. <laughs> He's saying, I wonder what is the currently the most exciting element of buying for him currently? What's the nicest? What what is That's a really nice question? What, what excites you about it? Um the new distilleries. Um, that's been a really wow. interesting challenge. Um and a really interesting experience, actually. Um, so I, I, I would include into that actually some of the new gin distilleries as well. So for, for a long time, I was just talking to companies who had existed for 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly I was talking to customers, that, uh, sorry, suppliers that had only existed for six months. And that was- Aaron really... would have come along, Aaron and um, yeah. I guess Kilhoman and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, Kilhoman, that was lovely, um, uh, working with Anthony and the guys there. but. Um, but particularly now at the moment, there's a lot of new single malts in the market. And um, I'm really happy that they're coming to us and talking to us and having an open conversation and, and you know, sharing our views about how to help with them launch. And initially, there was some concern, you know, would it work? How do you sell a three-year-old whiskey or a four-year-old whiskey or whatever? It's, it's not been a problem <laughs> because of the secondary market interest, I think. It's just doing it in the right way and thinking long term. But that's been just fascinating and a new challenge to um, learn about these new distilleries and work with them and launch them in the best way. And there's been just some tremendous new things come along. Darth Mill, obviously, Ardner Merkin, Link Main Distillery, um, King's Barnes. Some I haven't done it right, in my opinion, but there's been some absolute beauties there and so great. So just so happy to see them on our shelves. They made it. They made it to single malt. And even the ones that you perceive that haven't done it quite right were in such um, a vibrant uh, buyers uh, or buyer driven or just an exciting market right now that, that, that if they, they still have the ability to redress what they're doing and to bring it um, in a more interesting presentation and, 
and bring it in a way that's kind of going to be a little bit more exciting, I think. Um, I know that there's lots of factors involved. There's lots of drivers, most of them financial, of course. But you're right, it's fun how some releases just gets everyone excited. I'm thinking of the pent-up demand there was for Daft Mill after years of Francis saying it's not ready yet. Um, I'm thinking about very recently about um, Arda Merkin waiting until they were five years old and, and bringing out their first release and everybody, again, getting quite excited about that. And and there's there's can, there's going to be more of that going forward. In fact, tomorrow we've got the Tor of Ake release, right? I'm sure yeah, that's that going was, to be. Yeah. Well, that was one of the reasons for the long day today, just get, um, getting ready for that in a sense. But um, uh, yeah, that goes live, hopefully with everyone tomorrow, including us. Um, so interestingly, yeah. just for everyone on Tor of Ake, have you any idea what the the, the outturn is, what the release is? It's got to be thousands. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um I do know this. Have they not released this? I probably I'm just asking you, I, I I haven't looked into it. I, I, I have I'm on my laptop, I have the information somewhere there. I'll when, when something else happens, like the quiz, I'll, okay. uh, I'll find I'll, that I'll but, chat because <clears throat> I know what will but, happen. We we had a fear of missing out stream last week. You know, the theme was there's always more whiskey. Um, and I know that the Tor of Ek is, is continually being asked about, is it going to be available? Am I going to get it? I think at £50, they've waited a little while. Uh, that it's, it's, it should be, there should be plenty out there for us all to get some. Um, but I always... Well, I to, to reassure that and to try and just dampen down the, the fear of missing out saying um, it will... The, the release numbers are from memory, and I spoke about this with them quite some time ago, but um, it's more than Arda Merkin. And Arda Merkin was 17,000, right? I thought I had 18 in my head, but anyway, it's, I think we're low 20s maybe. Um, and they have mapped out a plan that there'll be another large release later this year, maybe even a third one. And so they've mapped out the next few years. So there's plenty coming. So do not panic. Don't pay daft prices at secondary. Um, it's only a three and a half or four year old whiskey. And it's, you know, it's going to be that bit better as we go along. So, you know, don't panic. Good advice. And I agree fully. Eric Waite is saying it is, it is not that the whiskey bubble will burst, but the world economy as a whole will burst. So people won't be able to afford, afford it. That could be an issue as well. Um, uh, of course, we don't, we, we're not always going to have money all the time. There's no guarantee of that. Absolutely, Eric. And Jimmy is saying, but there is no question that 75% bourbon tastes so similar. Uh, so Jimmy's in Canada. He's in the East Coast of Canada and um, probably gets access to a bit more bourbons that we do, mostly because it's column still whiskey. Pot still bourbon is where I want to be. And that's certainly a thing. And it's a thing that's growing in the States. But again, it's limited by availability and people are chasing that as well, Jimmy. And I think you're right that generally bourbon has a narrower bandwidth. But when I speak to bourbon people, I'm jealous of their palate because they can tell the difference. They can pick out their peanut from their caramel, from their toffee and their honeycomb. Whereas we just kind of taste these vaguely, I'm speaking about myself here, vaguely bourbon and American oak flavors, right? So, you know, but I think the bandwidth of flavors does tend to be a bit more focused in bourbon, absolutely. Marcus Kreitner is suggesting 32,000 bottles with 3,000 of those in the UK. Okay, good. Uh, Helen is saying, heard 3K for us. And Malt Review is in, Jason is in saying 32,000. Nigel Slynn is also confirming that. So that there you go, 32,000. So oh, there you go. just to put a, a perspective on that, that is double the release from Arden Murkin. Now, I don't know about the distribution. That suggests that there's going to be plenty going out to mainland Europe and further afield. So there's going to be plenty out there. So I, I hope everybody gets a chance, uh, for those that are interested, to get their hands in a tour of eight. Uh, and Callum, you're saying there's only 3,000 bottles in the UK. Everybody's answering the same things. And Whiskey Throttle Daniel is saying bourbon has more stories than a public library. I think that's true of all whiskey. So I paused you from speaking about something there. And I, I think I, I had the sense that if we go from the evolution then of eBay is not selling whiskey anymore. Um, you know, it's been through the retail uh, sale already suddenly these professional auction sites come along and fulfill quite a wonderful thing. Honestly, we're privileged to have them. I like nothing more than being able to get something through auction that, I've, that has long since gone that people have talked about or recommended to me. Maybe the ability to reach back 
time machine style into history and pick up a 1960s blend at reasonable, reasonable money, honestly, and to be able to sip history, okay, and maybe explore different things like old bottle effect and things at the same time. That's an amazing thing. But the secondary market, Arthur, must bring challenges for you as well as a retailer. Yeah, and for the consumer as well. And, and you know, there is disappointment, there is anger, there's frustration right at the moment um, among uh, the, um, the consumers as well. And I think you, you say that a retailer was a bit like a bridge earlier on. That's something that I, I think of sometimes. We're like this kind of bridge between the producers and the consumers. Yeah. And when war breaks out, the bridges are the first thing to get blown up and the yeah. retailers are... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I like that analogy, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> we, yeah. We've had a fair bit of that ourselves. And it's... Got it's the grenades that's... at the retailers, basically, right? Yeah. A little bit, but... Um, it, and I've been there the whole time and the, the pace of change has been very, very rapid. So, yeah, 2010, I think eBay... Um, well, 2010, I think Scotch Whiskey Auctions and then Whiskey Auctioneer a bit, a bit after. There's a few other, there's quite a few other auction houses. There's more turning up there's, all the time, yep. Oh, the, the scale of this business, and I totally agree with you that um, they do provide a valuable way of reselling uh, whiskey and you can access things that um, you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. And, and it's fantastic. But I kind of think we've got to get to the point where we all need to look at ourselves and say, they are also doing harm and, and that harm is kind of recently it's been growing. It's been intensified by lockdown, I think. Um, and probably if you think of certain markets by lockdown having been closed off, like the ticket reselling sites, um, that's going to make a diff difference if you're a professional reseller um, in that market. You've got to look for another market to replace it. And then we've had these constant articles that, talk about 40% of the annual returns on rare whiskey. For a very thin slice of certain bottles, if you buy perfectly, which no one does. Um, so it's really accelerated. And, and, and we've certainly found recently the number of professional organized buyers um, who clearly have no intention of doing any anything other than reselling the whiskey pretty quickly has rapidly increased. So if you formed your opinion two years ago, you should probably start rethinking that or at least reassessing it. You don't have to change your mind, but um, we're, we're at the sharp end of it. We see, we, we see people's buying records and um, this, the, the people this, are changing. This is super interesting to me because this environment is all about as being as inclusive as possible to not point the finger and blame and things and mm. to accept that what we're talking about here is enthusiasts and passionate people that are mm. paying a lot more for whiskey today than we were a year ago, certainly five years ago. We're all part of the problem. We all play our part in this, this dynamic, this thing that's happening. So to say, yeah, it's down to the producers, it's down to the retailers, it's down to the cash traders, to say it's down to uh, the collectors, the drinkers, the completists, or even the flippers, the scalpers, the every, everything, that, that we're all playing a part in creating that gap for people to come in cynically and to earn a living off do nothing more than buying something that they know that they know they can immediately sell um, for a decent profit. And I used to and I used to back off and I used to say, you know, we're all part of the problem. But then you mentioned ticket types. It's a perfect example to talk about this issue that we see of professional buying, where you see a venue that was once a thousand people, the ticket type would come in by five hundred tickets. Uh, people would organically buy the other five hundred, and it would immediately be sold out. And suddenly the perception was that the demand for that venue, that thing was much, much higher. So it drove the prices up and then the ticket touts were able to go in and sell at those inflated prices. If have we Are we seeing something similar to that starting to happen in whis whiskey where it's, it's more than just a hobbyist at home flipping? We're actually seeing scalping, like PlayStation 5 type stuff where there is a much more organized thing happening. Yes, <laughs> yes, we are. Um, and those people might also be whiskey fans. And, I, and I, it's a really good point you make about whiskey enthusiasts. 
And I'm not saying it's black and white. I'm not saying I've never sold a bottle of whiskey. I've ended up with too many bottles of whiskey. They, I, I don't actively buy and collect because it's a conflict of interest with my job. With you, you're all care. the same as me then, it's accumulation. They just seem to wash up on my shore, Roy. I don't know how it happens. Um, <laughs> it's passion. <laughs> passion drives it all. Yeah. <laughs> and but, then you're in a perfect position, I guess, to, to get stuff. So, we, we started because it was becoming a very commercial. We put rules in place for our staff, so including myself, that we can't pre-buy any allocated products. We can't sell them to our friends. We can't do anything like that. They go to customers. If we feel this demand, like Darf Mill or whatever, and we put one per customer on it, it has to be sold honestly. All our stock going in. So the, the increase in prices and um, the secondary market is the single biggest driver of price inflation at retail now, I would say. Um, if you leave aside really core cool range stuff, I think it's the biggest single driver of price inflation. It's about funneling it down. So if we're not an honest retailer, then, and don't put all our bottles out, our 100 bottle allocation is suddenly down to 80 bottles. And then we've got 20 good customers, power buyers, so that's suddenly down to 60 bottles. Then we put it online. And then you've got a group of people who are, and they might drink whiskey as well and really enjoy it, but they're recycling that profit very, very quickly. So we've actually gone to customers who have bought 50, 60 bottles in six months and said, looking at their buying record and said, your money's, we don't want your money anymore. Thank you very much. Because all those bottles and every single one of those bottles, <laughs> all we've lost is someone else buying them five seconds later. And if we ask a few of those customers to go away, we hope, for, we hope that a few more might go into the hands of actual people who are drinking them. And it's very obvious from certain people's buying records. Those are extreme examples. It's not that many people. You might hear, and there's probably comments going down already, but it's a free market. Sure. I mean, but Roy, let me ask you a few questions. Like, should Royal Mar Whiskies accept orders from owners of auctioneers? No, I, I, I agree with you fully. And, and can I say thanks for, the, for the, can, the candid comments as well, the candid feedback, because I feel for the retailer, the closest retailer of me, I would I would include. I've become very friendly with them. They're great guys at Good Spirits Company in Glasgow. There are great other, guys. Great there guys. are other uh, uh, retailers in Glasgow as well, all doing a fantastic service and the mm -hmm. best that they can. And I've never walked into a Glasgow retailer, bought a bottle, and felt like they've overcharged me five or ten pounds there just because that's in demand. They're selling at retail, so I know it must be tempting. I know it must be tempting. Clearly, you don't do it, but what what about the retailers that do sell to match or amplify the prices a little bit closer towards secondary market? Do you think that's within their right to do that? It depends who they bought it from. If they bought that direct from the distiller, then I think that's taking the. So <laughs> we we you know. We, and, and part of this is driven, actually, and we'll probably come and we should talk about Drama's Rewards as well, shouldn't we, that scheme that we've done. Um, well, I know you've mentioned Drama's Reward, and I I didn't bother listening to it at length because I knew that we'd bring it up, <laughs> we'd pick it up tonight. Because, no, I'm going to just straight out and ask you and say, well, you know, if if the retailer can't then, I mean, because, listen, anybody can run their business any way that they want. It's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But any consumer can spend their money where they want to spend their money. And if they see retailers abusing their position to, to take at wholesale prices and then suddenly match what they think the projected secondary uh, market prices, that's just a nonsense. And I think that, that customers would would leave in droves. I, I am Maybe I'm naive. Maybe they wouldn't. But I think they would. So what, what can retailers do? Because you've talked about picking up the phone. That must be really difficult for you or any retailer to do and say, listen, we see the pattern. We see how you're buying. Uh, please understand that we're, we're just trying to do the most ethical thing here. We're trying to bring integrity in. You should probably uh, either change your behavior 
or maybe try and buy a bottle somewhere else. That must be a difficult thing for you to do. So what it's, can you it's do? It's very bold. <laughs> it's very bold. But it was, it was so clear. And that guy, you know, as a buyer, this is called the Whiskey Bar, I think you called this episode. I actually said to the guy, after he denied, that, oh, how dare you say what I'm doing with my bottles, da, 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 da. Um, uh, after a conversation that lasted a little while, I said, look, I'm a whiskey buyer and I am full of admiration for what you've done. You're better at this than I am at my own job because his buy record was perfect. And, and I eventually got him to admit that he'd sold 60%, I think, of his bottles. And he'd made 15 to 20 grand, I think, probably. No, that, there's nothing he's doing that that's illegal. No, um, no. All, all he's doing is he's, he's the one that's refreshing that page early in the morning. He's queuing up early in the morning. He's there waiting for the releases. He's got the knowledge. He's doing the study. He's doing it. But... So we, we understand that, that that's a thing, but it's also a thing that is existing purely for profit. Um, and it does take so much whiskey out of the hands because I can afford an Ardemurkin at 50 pounds. Maybe can't afford an, an, Ardem an Ardemurkin at 80 pounds or 100 pounds or 150 pounds. And I also, I think that it's bad for the whiskey because Ardemurkin can live up to being a 50 pounds experience, no problem. But I don't think Arnold Merkin can live up to being a hundred and twenty pounds, hundred and fifty pounds experience, and that's true of so many whiskies. I, I'm just using Arnold Merkin as an example there. So, what can you do? It's a free market. Da 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 da. da. But I suppose if people started, to, we would look at people's buying records, and if they started to get too greedy, if it started to be suddenly, it's not just one for me. I've now got my wife's card set up and registered and she happens to order five seconds after me and then my brother and then suddenly eight cards registered to the same address and daft stuff like that. Then we just say, no, thank you. We know what you're up to. You cannot possibly be drinking this amount of whiskey. Yep. So the, the drama's reward idea came because um, you saw a lot of chatter online from whiskey fans frustrated and saying, well, the industry loves this. This is fantastic for the industry. They're fueling this. They want this to happen. And I knew from my relationships, talking to Grant at Springbank, Connell at Ardenberg, and you know, all the guys, the Kilcoman guys, and with very few exceptions, they were worried about this, this price inflation in the secondary market, and they didn't want it to happen. They wanted end consumer people to be paying 45 pounds for Ardenberg. And the drama's reward system was an opportunity to at least talk about that and say we value dramas a little bit more than collectors slash resellers now collectors we felt bad about because we're also collectors in our hearts yep. but it we just couldn't disentangle them so the system worked on getting the rrp and if it's below 100 quid the rrp we would add five pounds on to price and we would declare that we'd add five pounds on but if at the point of purchase you said you were happy for us to write your name and order number on it you would get 10 pounds in a voucher immediately to spend on anything after that anything at all so if you're a drama you are rewarded by getting that highly collectible and it's not all whiskey it's just some of these hot topics sure sure um, you get that whiskey at, if it's 50 quid, 10% cheaper than you are buying it elsewhere because you're drinking it. And that's assuming you come back and buy another bottle with your 10 pounds. If it's above 100 pounds, it's 10 pounds above RRP and you get a 20 pound voucher. It was, no one's done anything like this, still up to this point, And it took a lot of discussion, months actually, and talking to all our key guys. I came up with the idea, I did come up with that idea. I spoke to all our key guys, I spoke to a number of our suppliers, and almost there were a few people with a few concerns, but they were like, we like it. We want to be able to say, we want to get that database of dramas. We want to say thank you to them for opening and drinking and enjoying the thing that has been made for that purpose. We've tracked it all really carefully. There was a lot of people who said that won't make any difference to flippers. They'll still, um, they'll still uh, 
that they'll still flip bottles. No one would want their name written on it. That wouldn't make a difference. But we've actually see, seen a good response. It does depend on the release, and it does depend on what's happening on the secondary market. Um, because the poten if the potential profits become too great, then they don't bother with the, you know, the, the, the voucher and, and people are just so hungry for that bottle that we maybe get a less of a redemption rate. And it's fully funded by us as well. It's fully funded. So if 50% of the people do it and get the voucher, then we've lost no money. We've sold the whiskey for exactly the same thing. Um, we could take a big bath and on some bottlings, we've, we've lost a lot of money, but we've been never, never happier <laughs> to lose money because it's been meant cool spring banks have been going to spring bank fans who want to open and drink it that is interesting it's interesting and it's not just the kind of concept but the fact that that you have seen results that could make it work because there have been mm -hmm. other schemes and things out there that have always been interesting and i appreciate the sentiment and the will and the desires behind all of these creative things wow. i know of a particular release where there was um the label was marked with perhaps not a, a name but a number that could be tracked to a person. And if that ended up on the secondary market, you would be uh, uh, ineligible to buy any future releases from them. You would be it's struck off. Of. Yes, exactly. That's the one I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. But what so happened? Took, yeah. Really complicated that one. So com we, we need something that's really neat and clean. We put it in front of people. It's your choice. You do what you yeah. want. Um, but, um, but I think um, what was interesting about that one is that still a couple ended up in the secondary market. But because mm. of that scheme, it was only two or three rather than lots. And One the price exploded. It just rocketed. I mean, it went into four figures, I think, or close to. And that, you're just kind of thinking, this is okay. So I appreciate the, the, the challenges that, that, that you're going to have for this, especially if it continues, if it's going forward. I also appreciate what you're saying about the fact that it's been exacerbated through lockdown. Hmm. Are you talking about where you've actually seen people having a bit more time in their hands? They're at home in front of their computers. They're able to research and buy. Is that what's happening? Yeah. So if, for example, you take an office of people who work in an auction house or people who are um, uh, professional resellers of things, it might be tickets, it might be trainers, it might be... Okay, yep, yep. Um, that's their job. They can have as many browsers as they want open. So when Royal Mile Whiskey's put something out on Twitter or whatever, or Good Spirits or Luvian, you know, they're on it because that's all they're doing all day long. If you work in a bank or you're a landscape gardener, you can't sit there um, <laughs> monitoring all those browsers. So it was happening before. They were selling pretty quickly, but people weren't noticing. Not as many people were noticing because they were doing their daily job. Now everyone is at home, therefore more people are trying because we can all do a bit of work and have a few browsers on the go at home because there's no boss over your shoulder. Yeah. Um, so there's more people trying, but actually there's also more people noticing. They tried really hard, they were there at that time, and they still missed out, and they are perplexed why. And they're angry. Why? They're angry. Yeah. We talked about last week about fear of missing out transcends after the loss to fury of missing out in Matt McKay's words. So, and we've also- Can I just say one thing as well to reassure people, sorry, because uh, it might make people feel a bit better. There's a lot of rumors going around about bots and that you're missing out to a robot, which is the ultimate dystopia, isn't it? That you're yeah. just trying to buy a nice bottle of whiskey and Arnold Schwarzenegger's coming in and, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and buying it from <laughs> under your nose. That's a kind of a little bit of a myth um, there's not many the automatic buying software that then clicks through and places the order, all that kind of stuff. That rumor is swimming around. There's, there's, there's things that monitor websites and stuff like that, but a lot of, including us, a lot of web people are getting a bit more canny about that, and you are able to block it. And if any other retailers want to want help with that, they can get in touch um, because we're happy to share that information. And what it does more often than not is actually crash websites bombarding it with requests. Yeah. And so a lot of these website crashing that you see is bots, but it's people monitoring websites. So you're not losing out to a robot as such. Certainly not with us. We've done a lot of work on it. I think it might make people feel a tiny, tiny bit better. 
Yeah, we're not talking about PlayStation 5s here. We're talking about, you know, individual expressions of of whiskey. Um, I understand that completely. David Hong's bought me a dram as well. No comment or anything, David. But I'll raise a wee glass just to say cheers to you. What's in your glass? What are you drinking tonight? Uh, uh, that looks like water. That's water. <laughs> right. um, uh, I am drinking. Weren't we supposed to do bring a... Uh, official bottling on or something because I'm drinking that. I'll be telling you what the answer. Oh, is you shouldn't that. tell me what it is then. Oh, if of course, something else. <laughs> if, you're, if you're thinking of, uh, it's okay. So if you're thinking of playing a wee game of Visit Space Side, then absolutely you don't. We don't want to um, uh, let it out of the bag what you're drinking. Whiskey Radar Roland is saying uh, what some German resellers are doing, like Vindy Bottlers. And he mentions that an indie bottler there, Riga selection, I think, a Riga selection, is they keep certain expressions yeah. like Cocaine and 16 out of the online shop and they sell them only to on site, so that's the walk ins, eh, buyers and drinkers. Uh, James Hope is saying, fabulous to hear that Arthur and the industry are being proactive with the issue. Absolutely. Good to see you in, James. I hope you're well, my friend. Jimmy, like I said, there are always someone who will say that any idea is a bad one. Eh, this is not a bad idea. <laughs> so if you give Jimmy like the proof of it. <laughs> Jay Francis down in Ayrshire has seen got a bottle of Long Row Red on Drammer's Reward. So he's already taken you up on it. Well, paying extra at purchase isn't ideal, but I can see the reasoning. It's not so bad if you do buy from them somewhat regularly. I accept mm -hmm. that's brilliant. If you know you're going to go back again, if the voucher can be used in person or online, which I'm assuming it can, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and you're inviting any retailer for any of the topics that you're talking about uh, if, that are interested in having a kind of discussion or, or some guidance uh, that, you, that you're open to uh, sharing your intelligence out with them beyond uh, your own chain. Um, that's excellent as well. Greg is saying, true, Roy. Don't know what he means. Um, uh, but thanks, Greg. Yash, Des, uh, Yash Desai is saying, this is fascinating and a brilliant idea from Arthur. Some shops give incentives to people who agree to open the bottle in the shop right after purchase. I think there's some open container issues that we have there in, with Scottish law, right? Yeah. So I mean, there's one thing. That and variable out. pricing actually is difficult as well. You, you can't you can't do a one-off kind of discount, which is why the voucher idea that could be redeemed on something else later on. The legality is quite difficult. It depends, yeah. Obviously, on the territory that you're going to be in. Graham Fraser saying the traditional retailer customer relationship still works well for a regular over-the-counter uh, customers. People always come first, Graham. It's always people, and it's about integrity and building relationships and everything. Um, but you're right, it's, there's, it can be so much more complex than that. Um, Whiskey Throttle Daniel is saying sometimes drammers get offered substantial amounts to sell a bottle that they fully intended to drink, but the offer is too mm. good to refuse. So Daniel's in Canada, and it's really difficult because we complain about all this, this wonderful flexibility we have. And over in Canada there, they've got these provincial state owned and run liquor stores. And it's really quite draconian in so many ways. Um, Rob Whiskey in the Six is in here as well. So great to have you in here, uh, Rob. And they are constantly in their content on their channels because of where they are, they're talking about these things that they're up against. So we have to remember as well that we, while we have these grievances, we're in a very fortunate position in so many ways, it's not as good as uh, the Netherlands and Germany, I have to say. They seem to have it really good out there. They do. Uh, it's cheap as well over there. Yeah, absolutely. Andrew Piers is saying, the Cressmere probably knows it from the colour of the dram he is sipping. So the Sniper King is in. He, he's likely to guess your whiskey tonight way before I am. He's, he's won uh, well over a dozen coins already. Ross Fudd is saying, uh, I suppose having to walk in to buy makes uh, speculation less likely. There's a face-to-face -face thing there. Absolutely. Um, good to see you in as well, Thomas. Good to have you. Um, Tom, sorry. Uh, Evo's saying, I, I do find it a great idea, but I am concerned about the privacy implications. Will the data ever be used for other than its originally intended goal? Uh, and how can we be sure? I understand, Evo. I think that... Um, uh, uh, that's uh, the integrity there or the assurances would be implied, Arthur. Do you want to comment? That's a, that, that's a really interesting point, actually. So we have discussed that because what we suddenly noticed is that we potentially have a database of people who are prepared to open bottles. Um, and I don't think anyone else in the industry has that <laughs> because it's incredibly hard. You know, people, they'll all tell you that... Um, uh, that everyone's open to these bottles, and yes, I just love whiskey, and I, da da da. So we did wonder if maybe down the line it would be cool to do a bottling just for the drammers and to be able to email all those guys, and they get first dibs on it. 
and you don't have to charge more. Doubling down on the reward, but and you can ask them at the outset for their opt in for that kind of thing. Um, yeah, to, to yeah. keep you, which yeah. which we haven't actually. We probably should have done, but um, but we would never ever sell them on anyone's data or anything like that. But um, you know, internally, if people had opted in, we'd love to be able to market to people who just were prepared to drink any bottle of whiskey, no matter how valuable it is. Excellent. Um, I hope that helps, Evo, and uh, it's good to have the reassurance. Whiskey Whistle, uh, that's Mark coming in from Winnipeg. Don't get me started, so he's suffering the same issues that we've just mentioned. <laughs> good to have you in, Mark. Uh, and the Water of Life film, a, a whiskey film, has just bought me a dram, so I imagine that's Greg Schwartz. That's the director of the Water of Life film, and he's saying cheers oh, to yeah. you all. Raise a wee glass to Greg, and I'll say cheers to you, my friend. I hope you're well. Oh, Greg, I've just realised... We spoke before Christmas um, uh, about working together on a project and I didn't get back to my apologies, Greg Schwartz. <laughs> um, Listen, Greg, if it's any reassurance to you, when I reach out to Arthur, he's very late at getting back to me too. But <laughs> when he reaches out to me, I'm very late at getting back to him. So we don't need to apologize yeah. for cadence in this environment. Whiskey yeah. teaches us to slow down and have a bit of patience. I'm sure Greg will not have any issues at all. And uh, yeah. I, it's nice, nice of you to be able to connect through here. And Jimmy Legge saying, my privacy is not as important as my whiskey. Fact. So some people absolutely are just a wee bit, I think Jimmy is a wee bit more uh, pragmatic than most of us. So it's really crunchy, really. And I've noticed in recent V-pubs, we have been tackling these really geeky, really extreme, really jaggy end of the whiskey spectrum topics. From time mm. to time, we'll bring it back and make it a bit more kind of all inclusive, a bit more interesting for people coming into the things. And we don't want to scare people away. But talk everything that we're talking about. The bizarre thing is, Arthur, that there's a huge positivity to all of this. Yeah, we've got these battles and these challenges and everything, but it's because we're living in this this boom time of more whiskey than we've ever had at, at our disposable. Uh, sorry, at our disposal. Um, more choice, more variation. Arguably, more the baseline of of quality has has risen as well. I know that there are people out there, the Anguses and so many others, that'll say that the old whiskey was better and and things. And they uh, apologise, well, Angus. I'm putting words in his mouth, but generally there is that there is that kind of um, feeling. But I would well, say the old <laughs> the old rare bottle dealers will tell you that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, so what, what happens is that you know. These, these really good bottles and these really good casts that were cherished and they went down and, and uh, you know, legendary status. Of course, we're going to talk about those and reminisce and nostalgia will make sure that each time we recall the story and the memory, it's more powerful. But back in the old days, there were the, the troughs were every bit as deep as the peaks, I think. I think the baseline has risen now. And if I, went, if I walk into Royal Mail Whiskies now, the selection of whiskies that you have there and the amount that are still affordable you and I spoke casually, and I've I, I pull, I've pulled this up. I've done a video about this specific whiskey it's sitting here from last week. And um, this is a sealed bottle, but I've got another one open through in the next room. This is 30, 35 pounds. I don't know. You guys are probably retailing of that order. Fully natural product. It's age statement on there. But more important than all of that, lovely liquid, lovely whiskey. Yeah, it's really good. And there's lots of other whiskeys out there doing the same thing. So we always have to kind of rein it back a wee bit and know that we do talk about these these geeky things, but reassure ourselves that it's always a choice. There's always an, a, an option, and we can just re relax a little bit. Don't get caught up in FOMO and know that there's always going to be more whiskey. But it's nice to know that there are retailers out there. It's nice to know that there are people out there that are at least trying these new things because it's, it can be the greatest idea in the world. It could end up being a bad idea until you act on them and put them into place and discover the data that you're generating, what else can you do? Absolutely. I think when people care and whiskey fans really care about whiskey, they love their hobby. It's their hobby. It's like fans yeah. of, you know, season ticket holders at football clubs. Those are the guys you've got to look after and gals, you know. Um, but it's passion, um, it's, it's passion, right? Yeah, it, it's music fans who want tickets to go and see that gig. And um, and uh, when people care, we've thought long and hard about 
okay, it's an impossible situation right at the moment, but how do we do it fairly? How do we do everything? If we get a really disappointed, angry customer on the phone, we can say, we didn't sell any bottles to our mates. We didn't sell any bottles to ourselves. We did our best to minimize flippers and people trying to bypass all the rules to get those tickets. It's important to do it really fairly. Just to hear the spirit of what you're doing, just to hear that you're actively going out there and trying to put these things into place is encouraging in itself. Just to be able to go into all the retailers that we've talked about tonight, Good Spirits and Company in Glasgow, Royal Mel Whiskies, Luvians, Gills up in Creef. Oh, you could go on and on and on. I've never walked into any of those places and been overcharged for a fashionable bottle of whiskey. The longer we can preserve that um, the better. And I, I think that my feeling right now is I don't think we're in any danger of that happening. And I appreciate all your, your input on that um, mm. and your, your openness as well. Whiskey Games, Matt is saying you can always be in the remake of the movie. Ah, he's talking about the water of life. <laughs> Graham Fraser. <laughs> Very strict data protection rules these days. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Helen, I was just about to pick up your comment there and it skipped. No, I got it. She's saying, geeky and jaggy is good, Roy. Helen, I, no problem. For so many people, that are, they give me feedback saying, ah, we don't care how geeky it gets. The more geeky, the better. But, you know, um, let's try and keep it so that uh, it's not intimidating. Uh, I don't think it has been at all. Graham Fraser is saying, I, I did, I picked up that one. And Matthias is saying, I have some very expensive bottle of Little Mill, Little Mill and St. Magdalene. Not opening them yet, but they will be opened bought them now because they're only going to get more expensive. There's a lot of people doing that very thing as well, Matthias. And we talked about that last week, that idea that we've all got these bottles that we're keeping for the special occasion. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the special occasion is a Tuesday night. And it was interesting, the, the line that came out last week, if you open that bottle, it becomes the special occasion, right? Um, but I am the same as you, Matthias. It's the very same, right? So Sutherland is saying, hi, Ar uh, hi, Roy, Arthur and the Barflies. Stuck on night shift, so we'll catch up tomorrow morning. Typical that I miss this one as I really enjoy Arthur's YouTube content. Perfect segue oh. as well. Uh, Graham Young has bought me a dram to say, uh, cheers, Roy, just listen in with Gino. After a day snowmobiling, I caught the photo. Thank you very much, Gino, and thanks, Graham. He's saying, in the beautiful Eden we live in. He's in Canada as well, and he's he's choosing to stay on the positive side of things. He's not whinging about being difficult to get whiskey, but he's doing okay because he's raising a glass of Springbank 10 to you in the bar flies. I'll raise one right back at you, Graham, and thank you for your virtual drama, friend. Cheers to Graham. Cheers. Well, that's surely the definition of a good day, a day on a snowmobile. I mean, that sounds great. Yeah, they send me the photos as well, the kind of selfie shot with the two <laughs> snowmobiles set up there and the, this clean white powdery snow, the smiles on the faces. And all they're, do going, they're doing is going out there to blow off a bit of energy and a bit of, um, get a bit of kind of blood flowing in that so that when they do have that drama at the end of the day, it's all the more precious as well. Yeah, Graham and Gino over in Canada, great guys. So taking what Ryan Sutherland was talking about, can I say that's, this is the most exciting thing, the, the, re, the reason I'm most excited about you being on, and I told you this, I've already con confessed this to you, but I'll confess to everyone that uh, you had mentioned to me that you were doing a project with Dave Broom, and I was curious, I was interested, didn't act on it. Scott Adamson at Tomatin mentioned, have you seen the thing with the, and, and I said, I haven't looked at it yet. No, I haven't. And he said, you're going to love it. I said, well, okay, I've got 10 minutes before I go to bed. I'll... So I looked at this, uh, this uh, one hour long video talking about the excise act with you and Dave Broom for 10 minutes, I ended up putting earbuds in and going, and I'll watch the whole thing to the end and started watching another video that you put together on another subject, talking about women and whiskey as well. Uh, Honestly, can I share a clip? The best thing I can do here, Arthur, to talk about this project that you and Dave Broom have come up with is to share a wee clip just to give people a flavor of the content if we're talking about the jaggy end of the geek spectrum, right? Oh, this jaggy. is amazing. As you watch this, you might get an idea that it's the type of thing that's up your whiskey street. It had me purring like a whiskey-filled kitten. <laughs> But when I found this section, I realized we were really onto something. So let's bring this up on screen. So we're going to put this on two parts. You're probably going to, um, if you're really into whiskey, want to come back to this and pause it. So that's part one. 
what do we have, Dave? What we have here is an absolute blueprint on, on exactly how to set up a distillery. How every single piece of <laughs> equipment, what size it had to be, how it fitted together, how the liquid flowed through the distillery. This is how you make whiskey. Rather than, all right, have a license and use your old, old still. No, we are going to tell you exactly how whiskey is going to be made. So I'm going to, I'm, the, the link for this channel, by the way, is going to be in the description box below. And I'm, I'm putting it in the live chat right now as well. Some of you, Neil Cochran has already talked about the liquid, the liquid antiquarian is fantastic. Some of my audience, clearly there's overlap there, have already discovered it. So to my perspective, what we have there is we've got, we've already picked up from just the, the discussion we've had about Arthur Motley and his career and the things that he's doing. But we haven't even scratched on just how much of a geek you are, Arthur. We haven't, we've only <laughs> up with you, right? And it is, it's, it's incredible to hear just how much you are into this thing, not just the liquid, but the history and the things that represent that history as well. So we've got that. Arthur Motley is front and centre there bringing this topic and producing this thing, honestly. And your sidekick for this, your partner in crime, is Dave Broom. We're all fans. We're already invested in Dave Broom because he is bringing the fantastic articles um, that he's been publishing, publishing through the digital realm recently and the books that he's been putting together for years and years. But what, what we're seeing now is that, that Dave is now in this, this video realm, this digital video realm, where we're able to pick up Dave Broom in some regular form, geeking out on whiskey and its history and the things that affect it and the things that affect us through this channel that's appeared. Maybe a product of lockdown, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to ask you about that. Um, and, and just say, tell us about the, the liquid antiquarian. What is it? So, okay, so well, John, the origin story, I suppose, of the least exciting superheroes <laughs> ever. <laughs> Dusty antiquarian <laughs> superheroes. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I've known, lucky enough to know Dave for a long time. He used to come up and he was talking about rum as the next big thing, actually, at Whiskey, Whiskey Fringe. We had a rum chapel corner of, um, of Whiskey Fringe. And so I'd see him from time to time at events and we'd hang out and we always got on well. Um, and periodically, and it, and it started because someone who lives quite close to me, a couple of amateur archivists, were customers of the shop and I started dropping off their bottles and they started showing me a few things that they had collected. And I just love, I got this thrill of looking at old postcards, old labels, um, uh, maps, uh, whatever it might be. And I quickly became, I see bottles all day long, bottles of whiskey all day long. I still love them, but I just started selling off a few bottles because I wanted to collect old bits of paper, you know, like this, that is the Excise Act there. The, this is the 1823 <laughs> Excise Act that he's holding there, the original document. But what we're talking about with that article that I took the clip from there was, do you mind if I riff a wee bit about this? Because it's no, going to be to me. Um, we're talking about when you talk about the postcards and you're talking about these things, we're talking about evidence and testimony to a point in time that you can almost connect with through these kind of visceral, real, tangible things, right? You talked about the Small Stills Act. You talked about something I'd never even heard of before, malt use, a report that was done in between the Small Stills Act of 1816. And you have it there, no doubt. What's it called? The Malt Duties Report. So typically, before they change the law, there would be a, a big report commissioned. There's a problem. How do we fix it? Lots of MPs talk about it, and, and you get lots of very interesting information about the state of the industry or agriculture. Anyway, riff so on. Between the 1816 Small Stills Act and the one that we all know about here in the VPUB, the 1823 Excise Act, it changed forever the landscape of Scotch whisky production. We know it did, but we didn't always appreciate in what ways, how exactly, what and what, how much changed. You were When I started to watch that, that broadcast, that thing you put together with Dave Broom, speaking about this very act, I thought you were just going to take us through that and the impact that I had. 
And there you are, your discovery, because you went round all your peers in the industry and said, the, the Excise Act of 1823, yeah, you know about it, yeah. Have you read it? No. <laughs> Why? <am laughs> no, but nobody read it. <laughs> Nobody's oh. read it. You took the time to read this page after page after page of this legal reporting spiel, this act, and you discovered something that what, and that's what I tried to ca capture that passion. You mm -hmm. literally cheering there, you discovered this is a blueprint for how to put through and put together a distillery from this day forward. If you want to make whiskey legally, this is how it's going to be. Yeah. And if you go back and watch that thing, you'll see it. If you've been around distilleries, you'll recognize all those pipes and the fact that they actually they are all laid out like that. And they were quite different before. And so I suppose with Dave, he was one of the people I said, have you read this? Um, and why have you written about it? And all this kind of stuff. And then lockdown ha finally happened. And this format started to exist. And I just thought, this is perfect. We had spoken about a book. We'd, we had spoken about me maybe being, I don't know, researching somehow and, um, and, and him writing or something. And then this came along. We thought, no, kind of like the history of the world in 100 objects, but for, with booze and always trying to focus on primary, trying to primary evidence, trying to not read the secondary texts because you get a lot of just repeated history in that that turns out to be wrong. And I'm amazed how many new discoveries I've found. That and I think the digital age makes that worse. As soon as somebody writes something that appears credible, it's almost like lets people off the hook of researching it or checking it and literally copy and paste, copy and paste. It, it just spreads. And then, and then you, you're, so you're <laughs> discovering through going back and reading these original documents, some of the flaws, some of the mistakes, some of the misunderstandings. Yeah, so I was talking to um, uh, Bruce, who I don't know, but he's the global brand manager for Torre Vague. We're fixing up an online tasting with Torre Vague. And all very nice, nice to meet you all, and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, your website, it's really inaccurate about the 1823 Excise Act. Can I send you a link? Because it's really bothering me. Because they had, for, so for a new distillery, they're repeating the same kind of hoary old myths. So, that, that's kind of what we're doing. We take a topic each time. We, we did think it would be a very small thing and then we'd expand big, but actually we've got, we, we've really meaty discoveries and really um, meaty topics that we've had so far. And we've got two more coming next week. Um, as well. well, I have to say, I have to say, and, and I, you know, I, I opened tonight by talking about there is no paid promotion. There is no commission. There is no affiliate links. There's nothing like that. Everything that I've ever evangelized or raved about in the VPUB is because I enjoy it myself, because I believe in it, because I like it. This is this is completely new. Uh, the content, we are not, we are, do you, do you mind if I include you in the realm of whiskey tube? I think that's, if, if that's okay with you, Arthur, because you are, you've stepped in to that realm now, but you're bringing content that doesn't exist in that realm yet. Well, it's all original research. That's what we're doing. We are committing to 100% original research. And it's already fascinating. Now, the title being The Liquid Antiquarian, I'll ask you about that in a second. But it means that you do have the ability to step outside of the whiskey realm, talk about other yeah. drinks, other spirits, other things like that. But I think that from speaking to you on the run-up to this, it was looking like at the majority of... Uh, the content was going to be whiskey related. Before I ask you about how the name comes about and why you've chosen Antiquarian, James Hope is saying that he bumped into Dave Brim in a pub in Sussex two years ago. And I think he thought I was a weirdo when I told him I was a big fan, but he hid it well. I, When I met Dave Brim, I said the exact same thing and he seemed okay with it. And and he started to get a wee bit dis disturbed when I quoted some of his own books back to him. <laughs> <laughs> he put the start then. Andrew Butler is saying, hey, somewhere I have a copy of the Pilchard Fisheries Act of 1666. So whiskey. I would love to see that. Be fine. <laughs> Superb, Andrew. Uh, Ross Budd is saying, this is Arthur's archaeologist degree kicking in. Exactly, Tom. Exactly what I was thinking about. Lee Hosey Haddington Whiskey's bought me a dram and said that he's sipping a Royal Mail Whiskey's PX cask. Uh, Glen Ord. Cheers, guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, James Eadie. Yuli, I'll finish this wee a thrust from the Good Spirits Company. Talking about retailers. And in a clean glass, I'll pour a wee Imperial. Um, and I just want to catch uh, 
that looks like a new name. Martin Simanyan Tank. It looks like Simanyan Tank. Sorry, um, I know Martin. I'm, I'll just stick to your your first name. It's going to be easier for me, and I apologise for butchering your name. He said, Aquavita, is there a PDF rendition of the document? I don't know if that exists on PDF. And it's not going to smell nice. It's not going to feel nice. It's not going to have all that kind of tactile uh, connection with the past. Can I just say about that? So we are working on a model because it. I have a busy job. Dave has a freelance career of you know. And we are actually watching old, experienced, skilled hands like you have made a success of YouTube because we know nothing about it. Um, we know we have good content, but we're learning about that. And we may be talking about doing things like um, scanning something like the Excise Act, which isn't online digitally, and making that available to subscribers or Patreon. Or Whoever. So we are thinking about that, but at, at present, you know, it's bound and we would need to get it professionally done and there's costs associated with it, but making this information open source. Superb. Perfect. Perfect. And it sounds like if you're going down the route of a, a Patreon model, you're looking at crowdfunding, community funding, and which, which is absolutely, you know, it's not the only model. There are other models that work, but it's, it's certainly one that uh, I have found to be uh, the bit. Gordon Dadas is saying, congratulations to Arthur and Dave on a fabulous series. Love it. Good for you, Gordon. I'm glad you're enjoying it as well. Uh, Graham Fraser is saying, uh, I must be a geek too. I spent so many hours in the Scottish National Record Office reading this stuff be before it came available online. Graham, I know you're a geek because of what you post in the uh, Aquavitae uh, Facebook page as well. And I'm very glad to have you there doing that very thing, Graham. Peter Box is saying, so good to hear the cheering for primary documents, former library toiler here. So yeah, it's the right audience, and I knew that it would be for you, uh, Arthur. The people in here are going to be super interested. So as I drop in your uh, link again and ask people, just go along, give it a subscribe. It comes with my recommendation that this fascinating, fabulous stuff coming from Arthur and Dave Broom. You won't regret giving it a wee subscription and leave some feedback for the boys there as well. And I'm sure that Arthur, despite his busy life, will take the time to respond to you in the comments as well. Tell me, how did you come up with a bizarre name? Because it doesn't automatically make me think of fine uh, antique spirits or the history of whiskey or anything. The liquid antiquarian, where did that come from? So it's really on the on the the word antiquarian is the key thing here. So that's a, a word that is sometimes used disparagingly by historians or archaeologists, like as an amateur historian. But we wanted to just say this is not the Whiskey History Channel. This is not definitive. We are not professional historians because professional historians and archivists have skills that we can, you know, that are way beyond us. So, and it also gives you a little bit more freedom to be a bit more fun um, and than just saying yeah. this is the, the boozy history channel. So it just gave us that little bit more freedom. Um, as it happens, like the one on women, we got a lovely email from a professor of business history at Glasgow. Um, and he said the research was publishable and you're kind of doing real historical work, which I nearly fainted when I heard that. So, um, yeah, so we, we wanted to have freedom with it because there's many more interesting things than just whiskey because a lot of it is history and culture and society and how it's changed. So we, we didn't want to um, uh, make ourselves too narrow. So next week, for example, um, we got stuck a bit on whiskey because I had more material um, and we kept finding out significant things. Wow. Um, but uh, we're doing one broader one uh, next week. I'm doing one that's just called, when did we stop giving alcohol to our children? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I've already, everybody knows my age. I remember being small enough, but when I, I don't know if it was, I was teething, I've had some issues with my gums, but I remember that whiskey soaked finger being rubbed on, on my gum and things. Yeah. So that's, is that kind of that type of thing? Yeah. And going back a bit further and realizing just how much alcohol, um, we used one. to give to our children, yeah, a lot, a lot, and how that changed. And it's a uh, so we we have loads of we have about twenty WhatsApp topics between me and Dave, which is just this is an idea, and then we keep dumping stuff in it, and then we when we get close to a month of episodes, we zero in and kind of really knock out a theory, and and that one started with that question, and the title is stuck. There's a document in Aquavitae's Barfly 
page, I might get it sent to you by the original poster. And it's a prescription from the 1960s from a doctor for a hot toddy with a list of the ingredients, how much whiskey to add, how much honey to add. But the doctor, it says at the top, is a paediatrician. So this prescription is for cough medicine for a child in the 1960s, 1962, I think that prescription is. Uh, I don't know if that's interesting. I don't know if that's part of your uh, thing. But absolutely, please send it. And we have been saying we've been connecting with all sorts of interesting people who have already been getting in touch and sending us stuff and proposing ideas because there's all sorts of weird people out there like me who've been sitting on little bits of paper and not too sure what to do with it. And it's been you know, people from Australia, from Canada, from America, all over. Because because you, you get this, I think it was in the Barflies page. I'm checking the Barflies page now. I might not happen across it. Um, but it was certainly on Facebook earlier today. Um, but I, you, you know, you think that people are sitting on these these treasures and they're looking at it and they say, this is this is going to be interesting to somebody, but I just can't fathom who is going to be interested in this. Well, when it comes to that prescription, I hope maybe one of the barflies will, will remind me uh, who it was Please. that posted it and how to get a hold of it or who else saw that. But I saw that literally today and I commented on it because I was laughing at the very fact that it was a it was a paediatrician that had written the prescription. Sorry, but Pete's bought me a dram just to say cheers, Malt, mate. Cheers to you, Pete. I hope you're doing well, my friend. Thank you very much for your virtual dram. Um, and uh, Neil Cochran is asking if the 1823 Excise Act is available online. Is it available as a, an online document? No, it's nowhere. It's nowhere. That's why no one has read it until I managed to get, get a copy. Um, so there you go. It may be available online if you become one of the liquid antiquarians community, I guess. But right now it is not. Uh, excellent stuff. Uh, oops, everyone is saying, I stopped in America with the Puritans and Temperance Movement. Oh, it stopped in America with the Puritans and Temperance Movement, absolutely. And alcohol was the devil. Uh, some of the most fascinating documentaries I've watched about that, about prohibition, about all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's just amazing because it's not just about the whiskey. It's about the mentality, about how people thought, about how they interacted with it back then. Um, really, really fascinating. And he said, uh, Ross is saying, Thomas is saying, well, if you go back far enough, alcohol was safer than water. <laughs> That's probably true, absolutely. And Andrew Butler is saying, I can't remember if, when, if ever, I was too young for sherry at Christmas, certainly in single figures of age. So Andrew Butler is obviously of an age to remember uh, that type of thing. John Delacosina is saying, I used to steal beer from my dad when I was a four-year-old. My grandma would dip bread into brandy and feed it to us before bed when we would steal them. <laughs> <laughs> but John Delacruz, he's saying, he's saying, I think I turned out all right. <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? Just fascinating. Um, sorry, this this other computer I'm going to need in a minute has gone on the blink. I just need to start it back up again. Um, so you're not you're saying that you're not an actual historian, and yet you're sharing stuff there through YouTube um that's proving otherwise and i have to tell you like i said purring like a whiskey filled kitten it was fascinating that that excise act one had me hooked from the get-go so well I, the, the whiskey stuff in particular I, and i don't we are just so desperate for lockdown to end so we can access some archives because there's just a few more bits and bobs we need to do with some theories that i th well they're not theories they're they're backed by good documentary evidence that will crush how we talk about, in particular, the 19th century for whiskey, which is the most important century. So there's loads of revelations to come on whiskey in particular. I will be watching, absolutely. Before Thank we were live tonight, you had just knocked, you had just nudged over 300 subscribers. You're up at 376. I'm excited that some of the barflies, some of this community will be, will be participating in that as well. Um, and I look forward to bumping into some of you guys over there too. Um, I, I just tried to clean up some comments and uh, my moderators have already done it for me. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I seem to be back online with this. Um, have we got anything else to talk about? I think that that's a good kind of um, positive note to end on this project that you're going to head with, Dave. Um, I wish you all the very best for it. Um, but I'd like to, before we finish up, that something I always do, and you did say that you're kind of reluctant about quizzes and things like that. 
We're going to play a wee game of Visit a Space Side. I've got Eric uh, in the background. He's joined us. Uh, and I'm also going to um, invite you, Arthur, if you're willing to. I know it's very late now. It's getting on for quarters, quarter to midnight, a bit later. If you want to stay for the quiz, you'd be welcome to. I think you might have some fun with it, honestly speaking. Okay, great. Yes, no problem. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I'll tell you what, while Eric and I are playing this little game of Is It Space Side, you can have a look at that as well and let me know if you're in for a wee challenge of that. Because we're playing, not against so much just playing it for each other, it's so that people in the chat can get their hands um, on an exclusive sniper coin as well. Okay. Um, so uh, have a wee look at that and let me know if you want. Uh, to, I know you've been uh, keeping a, a wee bottle hidden off to the side there. Arthur, I'll speak to you in a few moments, my friend, and uh, you can see how Eric gets on playing a wee game of Is It a Space Side? Okay, cool. Uh, hang tight, and I'll bring you back in in a second. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Cool. Cheers. Eric, I hope you're in good shape to come in. Hello, Eric. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much for your patience. What I'm busy trying to do now is to bring up the... the um. Uh, the feed that I lost through this other laptop, it's a magnetic charger that's on it. And, uh, I've leaned a bottle box against the cable and it pulled the charger out. So the things have just sat here and gone uh, dead. So it's coming back to life now. We should be okay. How are you, Eric? How are you, my friend? I'm doing fantastic, you handsome bugger. It's so good to see you, my friend. It's good to see you as well. Now, the reason I've reached out to you ahead of all anyone else, and I don't usually bring people into play as a space aid when I've got a guest on, but the lockdown is starting to lift for you a wee bit and you're getting back to work from next week. So this is probably going to be the last week that you're going to be able to join us live, right? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, unfortunately for Ontario, they're projecting that we're going to get a third wave in about a month, so I might be in lockdown again and I'll get to hang out with the bar flies, but I'm always good for Sundays at the very least. So You're always good for Sundays. For sure. always, so you'll be here for the, for the lock-in on Sunday, but is the Sunday the usual, usually the day that you pick it up on um on replay generally yeah on thursdays normally when uh, for the most of the time when when you're going live i'm uh i'm torturing uh the locals with some yoga <laughs> but so uh, while well, you're live relaxed with a dram you're yeah. doing yoga now i did yoga for a wee while um one of my friends who enjoys whiskey uh yumiko she lives around the corner from here she's a yoga teacher as well and i went along to yoga um, and some of the guys that were going along to the class were um, older men, a bit like me. And I was amazed at the noises <laughs> that older men made when they're being <laughs> trying to stretch and do all of these incredible things. I have learned to, uh, I've discovered I have a poker face. Even when uh, noises come out, certainly out of the rear end, then, uh, you know, I just keep talking like it doesn't happen because it happens all the time. It's yoga, it's good for digestion, right? <laughs> yeah, I have to say, um, probably because of the, the 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 fact that there were some strangers there that I didn't know so well, I was able to keep uh, my poker face straight as well. But in more familiar company, it would have just been an absolute mess. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, it looks like um, I've got this back up and running. It looks like I'm, I've got a screen share going on again. Yes, we have. Eric, I'm glad you were able to join us tonight. This is the You've been on the show before. You've come on and you've done a quiz. You've guested on here before. This is the first time you're coming on to play a wee game of Community as at Space Side. Yeah, I wish you the very best. And I'm going to ask you, are you answering or asking tonight, my friend? Um, I am going to be uh, I'm going to be asking. I figured uh, I'll give you a bit of a break. So. Oh, that's awesome. So you need me to have a core range bottle on hand. I'll, I'll use this one here. I think I've been kind to you tonight, so, okay? So if Arthur comes on to do this, he doesn't need to do the asking. He can have the core range bottle. He just needs to say yes or no. I get the luxury of being able to say yes or no tonight. You've got 10 questions to guess what this bottle is, Eric. The first person to guess in the chat as well wins himself a sniper coin. Um, you've got 10 questions. I won't set the timer or anything because I know you'll get through these quite quickly. Um, and I wish you good luck. You've got 10 questions, Eric. Go right ahead when you're ready. Excellent. Well, um my first question is for uh, for Jimmy Lag, and you know, just because why not? Um, is it uh, Bladnik Eleven? <laughs> that would be incredible. It isn't, but it would be incredible, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, <laughs> that would have been the ultimate sniper. <laughs> I can hear him laughing all the way from Nova Scotia. Uh, <laughs> Bladnik Eleven. Is that what Jimmy guessed? Or no. 
no no cues from jimmy i just figured i'd make him laugh fantastic oh, no, no. Yeah, unfortunately I'll... it's not bladnik 11 but it could have been it could have been well i thought of that today and then i thought you uh, <clears throat> uh <laughs> I didn't keep bladnik, and i thought well, well mine as well but i'm having an, a little imperial with you right now i think what i'll go with is uh for question or uh, question nine is is it a space side no okay uh if we make del winnie the the center line and we're going to do this a bit differently. Let's do north to south, uh, west of the Delwini line. Uh, yes, it would be west of the Delwini line. Okay. Is it an Isla? No. Okay. Uh, then would it be a useless question, but would it be uh, south of the Delwini line? Yes. All right. Uh, would it be a a Campbelltown? Yes. Would it be from the Springbank Distillery? No. Ooh. Would it be from the Glen Scotia Distillery? Yes. Okay. Oh no. Hmm. All right. Does it have an age statement? Excellent question. Because no. <laughs> you have been kind to me. Yeah. Uh, and it would be the, uh, oh goodness, now of course I have to remember the name. Uh, the Glen Scotia double cask. Is it double cask? Yeah, you're, you're right with double cask, but you're wrong with the guess. Eric, you're down to zero. You've used all your questions to determine what the bottle is. You're left with one guess in order to get this right. You, ha I believe there are two possible answers left mm. against the ropes, my friend. Excellent. Uh, in Scotia it doesn't have a, an age statement. I feel if you listen closely enough, you can hear Jimmy Legg just screaming through. <laughs> Three countrymen letting the letting the side down potentially. Oh, I know. There's uh, uh, well, then I'm gonna have to go with the Victoriana. Oh, no, oh! <laughs> yes, it's Victoriana. Oh, right, fantastic. You're worried it was the what is the Campbelltown Harbor? Was it they called it or the something harbor i can't remember the entry level 40 percent one double cast 46 in uh, glen scotia this is a nice abv as well really old school whiskey wonderful stuff 54 percent abv eric <laughs> you snapped victory from the jaws of defeat well done my friend well done and um, i don't know who was the first one to get it Victor glen scotia victoriana but i think they got it way in advance of you getting it as well i'll, I'll look for the moderators uh, to congratulate whoever got the sniper coin in the chat. Um, Eric, that means that you've won yourself a sniper coin. Um, you've already got some sniper coins. Do you want it shipped to you? Well, I've got about six, I think. Nowhere near the sniper king. But uh, I think today I'd love to send mine. Uh, I think I think he's somewhat locally to you. Uh, Callum Muir. New Callum friend. Muir. Facebook page. Send that uh, over to Callum. Fantastic. Callum, uh, yeah, he is a barfly. He's a supporter. He's here. I think he's in here tonight, in fact. Callum Muir for the sniper coin from Eric Cunliffe. Fantastic. Eric, superb. Uh, you mentioned that you've got a, an Imperial in a glass. I, I do. That, uh, yeah. Okay, very, very similar bottling to mine. I've got a UK release of a 25-year-old Imperial from Smoz as well, Single Monster Scotland. Really excellent stuff. Really excellent stuff. It is indeed. Just, just pure tropical fruit. Yep, very, very light top fruit, kind of light mango, light pineapple, very creamy, lovely light malt as well. And that idea that it's just the cask is still, so it's just letting the spirit shine even after 25 years in my case, and what was that, 23 year old or yours? Yeah, same same here, bourbon barrel. And uh, yeah, one of your favorites, uh, one of our favorite styles, uh, I must say. It's just awesome. left for long enough, right? It's just, it's wonderful. It's an absolute treat. Eric, it's always a treat for me to hang out with you and see you as well. Um, do us a favor, hang out for the quiz if you can. 
Likewise, yeah, I've got a I've got a business interview at seven thirty, so I think I can hang out. And uh, good thing it's uh, virtual, so she can't smell my breath. There you go. <laughs> Perfect, absolutely. Every all these clouds have silver light, or should I say, amber linings? Bye. Cheers to you, Eric. I'll see you back shortly, my friend. Thank you. So there you go, Arthur. You get the concept of is it a space side? I think you're ready for a wee game of that. All you have to do is answer yes or no to me, and I'm okay. going to be doing my best to guess uh, uh, what what you have. I'm trying to see who won that. Who won? Everybody's asking who won. Um, don't know who won it in the lounge, but uh, I somebody's won a coin. You up for it? Got it. Yep. Excellent stuff. I'll bring in this. Now, I'm asking you, so I'm handicapped now. I, I only get nine questions, which is a wee bit of a pain, but we'll do the best we can. All I'm going to ask you, I've got a three-minute three minute timer here as well, Arthur. All I'm going to ask, it's definitely a Scotch single malt whiskey from the core range that's widely available to everyone. Yes. Correct? Excellent. Okay. Yeah. I'll start the timer. I'll take my handicapped quest, point away or question away, and I'll ask you, is it a space side, Arthur? No. Is it a Highland? No. Is it an Isla? No. Is it a Campbelltown? It is. Core Range Campbelltown. Is it from Is it from Jane A. Mitchell's? Yes. Oh, I should have just asked if it was Springbank. Uh, does it have an age statement? No. Is it a long row? No age stated. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, beauty, beauty, beauty. I have to say, if I'm honest there. <laughs> You have been a wee bit kind to me, but I'm very, very grateful for it. Thank you so much. Long row, no age statement. Excellent whiskey as well. We don't care that it doesn't have an age statement on there because it's always fantastic to sip um, and still affordable. And for a Campbelltown, one of the always availables, right? Mm. Well, <laughs> okay. One of the more widely available than some of the other Campbelltowns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even you know the Springbank tens are running out now. The the Coquerin twelves last year disappeared, and uh -huh, it's getting difficult. And we sometimes forget just how little product is actually made down there um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, capacity. But there you go, a good choice, and I'm very, very glad that you were kind to me there. That was a good and quite a nice, easy, quick one. Loads of folk would have got uh, long row. Uh, uh, just what do they call it? They just call it long row peated, I think, or yeah, long row, just long row, long row 46, isn't it? Peated yeah. Campbell, long row, yeah. No one quite knows what to call it. Yeah. It used to be long row CV. It's that's kind right, of that's right. I've got a bottle of long row CV in a sealed bottle, <laughs> I should admit. But it was one that I was in, it was in Italy, and I went into a deli in Italy, and they just had this on the shelf. And it was mm. they were still selling it at retail, it was four, four or five years ago now, I don't know exactly. And I just bought it and brought it home with me because it's nice. It's got the Italian tax stamp and things on it. It's just nice to have. I had tried it before. Um, but yeah, that's back in the days. We've been back about eight years, nine years now, I think. Yeah. I opened a bottle last year, actually, or maybe the year before, but relatively recently that I've been sitting on for a long time. And I was so delighted with it. It's really, really good. That is a bottle to look forward to. It's um, excellent, excellent. So that's history. one of those ones when I do open it, it will make it a special occasion, right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's really, really well put together whiskey now. I might do that when I've got a couple of barflies back here in the studio with me. I'm looking forward to getting back to those days. Mm. Anyway, um, fantastic. Thanks for being a good sport, and thanks for being a good sport and staying with us for the quiz at the end as well. I'm going to try and rattle through this quickly tonight, and I know that I always say that, but I will genuinely do my best. I'll bring in my friend Eric so you can participate as well. 
and I'll add the quiz to the stream. Remember, everybody, if it's your first time, um, thanks very much for hanging out and staying till the quiz. If you're not up for quizzes and you want to float off to bed, I'll just raise a wee glass and say thank you very, very much for staying with us till the end. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Arthur. I certainly did. The quiz is intended to be a wee bit easy sometimes, a wee bit tricky other times. There will be banana skins and asshats. And I promise that despite some of the questions tonight being tricky, there will be some easier ones in there and there will be nothing like the epic event that we had last week from a friend over in Belgium, Menno, who brought us probably the most challenging quiz that we've ever had after <laughs> last week. I felt like I'd been sparring and I was very, very grateful to scrape a five out of ten pass mark last week. Anyway, cheers to everyone and thanks for hanging out for this long. Cheers to you all. This Imperial is gorgeous. The quiz tonight has been passed over to the doc for his uh, canny eye to scan over the questions, and he rated this 10 out of 10 tonight is almost achievable. Some of the questions, it will help if you're paying a wee bit of attention. Let's roll straight into question one and say and ask, which Speyside distillery was famously only open for less than half of its 100-year lifetime before finally being demolished in 2013? Which Speyside Distillery? Is it A, Banff, B, Imperial, or C, Brora? Always helps if you slow down a wee bit and read the question properly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll ask you guys to do it if you can, if you've got a piece of paper. Um, if you can fold up a piece of paper with an A, B, and a C on it, and then I'll, when I hold up a piece of paper, I'll just see the letter. Um, that'll save you kind of shouting out, and you'll be pulled up at the same time. Hells with Helen is saying that was brutal last week. It was. It'll go down in history as being one of the most difficult ever, but it was still great fun. Andrew Pierce is saying, as long as it's not as tough as multi missions quiz, we are all happy. And Tutel Rob is saying, it's easy. <laughs> Good for you, Rob. Good for you. So, guys, hold up your. Uh, what I think after still. I got it. I got it in there. I only yeah. had the 1823 excise act to write on, which wouldn't have been good. Oh, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Just tell us, Arthur, are you agreeing with? B. B. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Banff is in Speyside, but it was uh, started early 19th century Banff, famously bombed during the war, etc. Uh, burnt down lots of fires, famously the most unlucky uh, distillery in history. Uh, Brora is not in Speyside, of course. Brora is in the, the Northern Highlands. So that leaves Imperial. Imperial was uh, closed for, by my calculations, more or less, it was it was closed for 56 years and open for only 45. And then it ended up being mothballed for a number of years after that. And they finally demolished in 2013. That's actually what we are sipping tonight. And Imperial is wonderful liquid nowadays. It's mature now and it's still pretty affordable for a long lost distillery relatively relative to so many others. Two, the JSLMA, quite a mouthful there. I think that's the Japanese... Spirits and Liquor something association. I can't even remember what the acronym stands for. But recently, they've defined uh, and tightened the regulations, meaning which of these whiskies will soon no longer be labelled as Japanese whiskey? A, Suntory Toki. B, Nika from the Barrel or Nika from the Barrel. C, Nika Coffee Malt. Now, what this means and it's been, it should have happened a long, long time ago, but it's taken a while for it to happen, is that sometimes you can buy a whiskey that is presented and you have the feeling it is everything um, about it that makes you feel like you've bought a Japanese whiskey and there's nothing on the label to suggest otherwise, but there are no really tight regs in Japan currently existing, so they can import bulk whiskey from Canada, from Scotland famously, and they can repurpose it. They can either sell it directly or they can blend it with other things and not necessarily have to disclose that. That is changing. So they've got a few years ahead of them now to get the, to get everything in order. And eventually, for it to be Japanese whiskey, it has to be uh, mashed in Japan. It has to be, uh, you know, the usual thing that we have in Scotland, it has to be distilled, uh, fermented, distilled, and, and I believe bottled in Japan as well. That means that one of these will no longer be labelled as Japanese whiskey. Can I have your guesses, please, Arthur and Eric? A, Suntory Toki, B, Nika from the Barrel, C, Nika Coffee Malt. Both of you think B, Nika from the Barrel, and absolutely the line, all the bar flies agree with you. Almost exclusively, Nika from the Barrel will no longer be Japanese whiskey. 
Well done. Question three. Under Billy Walker, Glenallachie launched its new core range in 2018, but which of these was only added a year later? Now, I'd expect Arthur to know this, but I'm asking him to go into his uh, memory banks back three or so years. Uh, so they launched with a, a core range, but one came along a bit later. Was it the 12-year-old that took its time to appear? Or was it the 15-year-old? Or was it the 10-year-old cast strength? A, 12-year-old. B, 15-year-old. Or C, 10-year-old cast strength. This was a release that passed me by. I saw it one day on a shelf and thought I didn't even think that existed. I missed the release of this one when it popped out. I have it now. Ko N is saying Japan will just call it a blend of world and Japanese whiskey, and they are already doing it. Good. Okay, that's an easy one for you, I think, Arthur, maybe. I don't know. Are you guessing here? Well, my first thought was 15. The B. Eric? I'm going to go with B as well. Three Bs in a row so far. Absolutely, the 15-year-old took them a year before they came out with that one. Very rich, very sweet sherry style of whiskey. I think there's significant uh, PX in there as well. Four. Port Askeg, or as they would say closer to Isla, Port Askeg, is a range of Isla single malt whiskies from Elixir Distillers. Named after what? A, a seaport on Isla. B, a long-closed distillery on Isla. Or C, a traditional bagpipe march from Isla. What is Port Askeg, that range of single malts, uh, Isla single malts, named after? A seaport, a long, dis a long closed distillery, or a traditional bagpipe march? Now, there's lots of three out of threes. Looks like most of the lounge is scoring three out of three so far. So will this one be any kind of banana skin to anyone? I have to say it doesn't look like it. Hold up your answers when you're ready, guys. What do we have? B. Oh, hey. Eric, what do you think? I'm going with no, no, I'm sorry. I, I'm A. Sorry, I'm A. Okay, you've circled A at the top. I see that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I thought you'd slipped on a wee banana skin there. Absolutely right. I didn't catch you out with suggesting it was a long closed distillery. It is, in fact, a seaport on Isla. I was lucky enough to participate in a Port Askig vertical tonight, uh, this week at the Glasgow Whiskey Club. Um, and it finished on a 45 year old. It was just an amazing lineup of uh, whiskies. Quite incredible. Five. Port Askig is what we're looking at there. What I'm going to ask you is which of these distilleries is closest to this seaport? A, Ardmo, B, Kalila, or C, Jura? Closest as the crow flies, closest by walking, closest by driving, closest, just closest this time. No need to define it any further. Wow. See Arthur, maybe geography is <laughs> going to be his Achilles heel. He kind of smiled and chewed in his pen a wee bit there. Eric, I, you're out. Right. Which province are you in? I'm in Ontario. Ontario. Okay. So maybe your west coast of Scotland geography. Yeah, I'm stuck between two here. I've already written something down, so I'll stay with it. But we'll Go with it. Okay. Hold up your hand when you're ready. Drunk geography is my problem. You know, Isla is... <laughs> What is what is that? After? C. I'm C. I'm C. And Eric is in A. Arnold. Sorry, B. 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 I'm B. I'm B. I'm B. B. You need you need a letter on three different pieces of paper. I think. <laughs> I think it's A. Don't know. So you're saying Kalila, Arthur, yeah. and uh, Eric has gone for Arnold. I can tell you that it's immediately next to Kalila, right next to Kalila. If you take the ferry out, uh, you can look back at the site of Kalila there, hidden away in its wee cove. Um, thank God for Kalila, right, Arthur? <laughs> now it's going to get tricky from here on in. Now the, the back nine, the banana skins are going to come out, and we might be finishing with a bit of an ass hat question as usual. Question six, Elixir Distillers now have a go-ahead for the Ryla Distillery, but what was added since their initial application back in 2018? So what we see now that's been released is quite a bit different from the initial application that we would have seen three or four years ago. What has changed that's quite significant? Is it A, a new name, B, whitewashed walls, or C, 
high gravity distillation. Now, the high gravity thing I took from an internet search, you could just call that gravity uh, distillation. I meant to go in and delete the qualifier there. So we're talking A, a new name, B, whitewashed walls, or C, gravity distillation. Jimmy Legg is saying, I don't think every answer could be B. Am I toying with you though, Jimmy? Am I toying with you? I actually don't put any thought into the order. Uh, Arthur is already answering and suggesting it's whitewashed walls. Eric seems to be thinking that it's gravity distillation. So we have the first split. One of these guys are going to fall behind now. Most of the lounge, unfortunately for Eric, seem to be siding with uh, Arthur. And I can tell you that Arthur is right. The original planning permission went through for kind of uh, wood cladding and turf on the roofs and things, maybe something similar to a hidden distillery like the new McAllen. Um, and the Elich and the planning just threw that out. It had to have slate roofs and, yes, whitewashed walls to be much more traditional and in fitting with an Isla distillery. Uh, so that's what's going ahead. We don't know what it's going to be called. It was originally talked about based on the location, Farkin, which I think would have been a fantastic name for a whiskey. <laughs> However, the, um, it might be nice for them to see at least a wee single expression with that name on it. We don't know what the distillery is actually going to be called. Question seven. The Liquid Antiquarian Project on YouTube has so far not covered this whiskey-related topic. This, uh, if you've been listening tonight, it will help you, of course. The Liquid Antiquarian has not covered A, Weird Stills, B, Prohibition, C, Hidden Women. What has not been covered on the Liquid Antiquarian? And I'm not saying it won't be. It may be. I think it should. I think it's fascinating enough in itself to be talked about. But is it A, Weird Stills, B, Prohibition, and C, Hidden Women? I'll just ask you to guess this time, Eric, because Arthur should <laughs> have a good idea. Well, I purposely do not have the lounge. Because, you know, that's good. good for you. Good for you. Not cheating, but you know, it's suggestive. I know it's not hidden women. I, I, I remember that. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with weird stills. You think it's weird stills that they have yet to cover? Arthur is holding up. No. <laughs> B. They have discovered weird stills. Fascinating. This is how niche the content is going to get. Just listen to it. It's absolutely fascinating. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. What's the chances of you covering Prohibition at some point in the future, Arthur? Uh, the material is really expensive um, to get good Prohibition stuff. It's really popular. People yeah. collect it really avidly. So um, we've been kind of priced out of that market. But absolutely, we want to get in there. It's amazing. Excellent. Superb. Yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about it from that perspective. If you're actually trying to get these tangible objects, these documents, these things, if it's something popular like prohibition and the culture that comes around that, then I can understand how that could make it uh, difficult for you. Fascinating. Yeah, it's, the it's the equivalent of trying to buy Chichibu or Darth Mill or something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Question eight. Another banana skin potentially. Which of these distilleries are now producing malt thanks to Inverleaven, Inverleaven sorry, stills? A, the lakes, B, Brookladdy, C, Waterford. Ah. Now, Inverleaven was a malt distillery built inside a uh, Dumbarton. I, I'm, suddenly I'm doubting myself, yeah. it's Dumbarton, isn't it? It was built inside the Dumbarton complex to make malt whiskey up there. Um, Eventually, it was wound down and shut down and stayed dormant for a long, long time. Um, but, but the stills have gone on to have new life. I'm asking which of these distilleries are now producing malt thanks to Inverleaf and stills? A, the lakes, B, Brookland, or C, Waterford. Bit of a banana skin, potentially. Hold up your letter when you're ready. Go ahead. We've got, is that a B, Arthur? It's and a B. Okay. And for leaving, the stills were bought by Brookladdy, but Brookladdy only kept a Loman still, and they called it Ugly Betty, and they make more gin than whiskey at Brookladdy now using Ugly Betty. The malt yeah. is being made with Inverleaven stills at Waterford in Ireland, so that brings you boys level, doesn't it? Uh, no, he's the one, I think. 
I've got uh, five out of eight. Oh wow! Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was right. like, and then I deviated. You know. Okay, so you've got a pass mark though, Eric. You're already past the pass mark. Uh, yep, pass mark for sure. And we know that. Very honest, Eric. <laughs> that, that's the first slip up from Arthur, isn't it? Yeah, and I knew I was uh, annoyed. I remember that they were sitting out by the warehouses at Port Charlotte, and I was like, I've seen them there. But I had a, yeah, anyway, move on. <laughs> well, that's right. Port Charlotte had the spirit still, and the wash still used to sit outside the distillery at one point. Remember, they had it as yeah, a kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, I think they've just got barrels there now. Um, and eventually, obviously, Mark Rainey took, managed to broker a deal and get those taken over to Waterford. Um, so it's kind of cool that they're yeah. living and breathing and making spirit again. Second from last, question nine. The icons of whiskey for Scotland in 2021 winners were announced on the 5th of February. I meant to mention this last week. Um, but Communicator Award went to A, a foreign journalist, B, a female spirits blogger, or C, a YouTuber. So the Icons of Whiskey Award, they have Rest of the World, they have Irish Awards, they have Scottish Awards. They go out every year, and uh, these uh, Icons Awards are announced annually. Uh, this one struck me specifically, this award going out, and I wanted to make note of it. I thought it was interesting. Um, either of you guys guessing? Oh, definitely. And you're guessing, Arthur, as well? I'm guessing this... No, I... Well... I'm confused. I feel like the answer in my head could be one of two answers, but yeah, depending on your definition. But I think I know who it is. I think this is split in the lounge as well. This is the first one. Uh, Marku Mackinnon is saying no idea. Joseph Van Name is, is suggesting be a female spirits blogger. Um, I have to say that uh, the icons of whiskey for uh, the Communicator Award went to Swedish whiskey girl, Moa Nielsen, who was on the VPUB last year. And she's come along and started to bring content to YouTube. She's very prolific. She's bringing lots of content out there, doing a fantastic job as well. Um, but it went to a YouTuber. And I think that's amazing. Now, I understand why you got confused, because she's foreign. Yeah. Um, it, she's a female. And yeah, she's blogging via video, you could argue. But specifically, the answer there, the clear answer there, is it went to uh, a YouTuber. What, what well, I have? wrote, I wrote B, but Moa because I, I know a Swedish whiskey girl. But I thought, is she a blogger or is she a YouTuber? Okay, she's a YouTuber. I think you should take that point. I think that's a point. After all, <laughs> I knew who it was. But... And, and if you it's, were, were relaxed about that kind of thing and the, the quiz at the end, uh, you go right ahead. You knew the answer to that. You knew, and I can tell you that her uh, chosen format is the YouTube platform. I want to raise a wee glass and say congratulations to Moa Nielsen. Well done to you. Cheers. I'm also a wee bit invested. I'm personally excited about that, that the platform's getting a bit of um, recognition as well. Mm. And finally, I'll jump in, before I share the ASAC question with everybody, I'll jump into the chat just to see how many of us are sitting after that on a nine out of nine tonight. Andrew Butler is saying, Aquavite, she has a blog too. I know, Andrew, if, if anybody said a blogger, it's okay for me to take a point, but you can see specifically the purpose of that question. Uh, and I haven't read her blog, if I'm honest. I've only uh, watched the YouTube content that she's been sharing. Whiskey Radar is on eight. Is there anybody sitting on a nine or have a derailed absolutely everybody from the great scores on the front nine earlier? No, Andrew Butler. Of course, Andrew. Fantastic on nine out of nine. You know your stuff, buddy, but it's been a tricky one tonight. It's not just about knowing whiskey stuff. It's not about community. It's not about content. It's not about all of these other things. I'm always amazed at your scores, Andrew. Superb. Graham Fraser, sugarly peg time, he's saying on 9 out of 9. Absolutely. Good for you, Graham. Fantastic stuff. Uh, 8 out of 9 for Kenneth Hanna. That looks like a new name, Kenneth. It's wonderful to welcome you in, my friend. It's good to have you here. Ian Bowes, 8 out of 9. Hellswood, 9 out of 9 in that case. Superb for you. She's taken a point for the B from that one. No problem, Helen. You go right ahead and, and take the point. Excellent stuff. Okay, I will declare that this is an ASAC question to potentially be every ASAC question that Menno brought us last week. How much hate am I going to get for this? Question 10. Which of these countries does not appear in the top 10 export markets for Scott Single Malt? Okay, you're already wincing. A, 
Is it a country that's governed by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador? <laughs> is it a country that's ruled by King Felipe VI? <laughs> or is it a country that is led by, by a prime minister called Mark Rutte? <laughs> this is the... This is what an ask that question is, Arthur. I do apologise. Not only do you need to know, potentially, what markets are buying single malt, but you have to know who are in, who's in charge of those countries. All right, okay. Okay, I am getting the hate. Here it comes. Jerry Miller is saying I'm sitting on nine questions, just not nine right answers. Good for you, Jerry. Um, and Andrew Butler is saying there were two with two correct answers. You need to point out what the other one was. Um, and I'm okay uh, with anybody taking it. Everyone is saying, you bastard. Everyone, I have to say, I was really emotional tonight and I thought about you, my friend. Everyone works for NASA. And I watched uh, uh, the Mars, the Perseverance rover um, touch down oh. as much as we could see that as on uh, Mars tonight. Really chuffed, really excited to see that kind of relief of everybody involved in that project. And I know you had... A vested interest in that yourself, everyone. I'd just like to say congratulations to everybody for the success of the Perseverance rover and looking forward to see what that brings to us in the future. Well done, everyone. Cheers, my friend. Good to have you in. Did you get to watch that? Did you get to see that at all? Guys, no. It was really cool. It was really cool. It touched down, and within seconds, we got these black and white images through of this kind of dusty atmosphere and the rocks and things on Mars. Absolutely fascinating, and the speed that it had slowed down at—I think this—I think it was going at something like five kilometers a second at one point, and then they had to slow it down so that they could—they could obviously get it to land safely on the surface. Okay, let's get this out of the way. I'm just going to take a lot of abuse for this one. What's your guess? You're guessing that it's real. Yeah, B. Either of you willing to guess the country? Uh, it's, it's Spain is King Felipe the Sixth. The country that's led by Mark Rutte, the P Prime Minister, is the Netherlands. But I'm actually looking for Mexico, which is governed by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Mexico is in the top ten export market for Scotch whisky, but not for malt. That is just one of the potentially the worst asshat questions that I have ever Oof. shared with anyone. Is there anybody managed to, I'm looking at Andrew Butler and I'm looking at Graham Fraser, is there anybody that managed to hold it together to reach a 10 out of 10? Helen and Andy guessed A, obviously, and they've managed to get their 10 out of 10. Congratulations to you two guys. Now, what we need to remember, yeah. Helen and Andy, two heads are better than one. So they're kind of, they're working as a wee team there in the background. I'm going to get one of them on live and only one of them has to play the quiz one night and break up that kind of a uh, little... Uh, collaboration that they have going on in there. Well done, Helen and Andy, again. Well done for the 10 out of 10 score. I'm looking at Graham Fraser in the hope that he's managed to hold it together as well. 9 out of 10. Oh, an angry face as he's raging. I'm so sorry, Graham. It's going to be the last one as well. That leaves Andrew Butler. Hey, Graham, I've, I've lost a friend there. Andrew Butler, 9 out of 10, you bastard. <laughs> oh, dear, I'm so sorry. What was your scores, guys, in the end? I think you did well, 8 out of 10, Arthur. I think I had ten. Yeah, brilliant score, Eric. A clear pass mark. Really, I did well for me. I uh, I got five out of ten, so I did better on Menno's quiz last week. <laughs> oh wow! That's so do you know can, what? Can I ask something for you? It was the back nine. It was the banana skins and the ass hats. Yeah. Sorry, say that again, Arthur. Can I just ask something? This knicker from the barrel, like people might have noticed me fiddling around my laptop. I wasn't looking up answers for the question. I got an email from Nicker Distillers saying none of their labelling is affected by this recent change. I'm just curious where you got that. I mean, this is, we could have talked about this after the show, but... No, where, no, did, where did you... you brought it up because Andrew Butler's pointed out that there were two questions with two potential correct answers. Nika from the barrel falls out of that, according to Master of Malt blog, who reported on the legislation and the changes. Well, so, I, I actually went back and I checked my email, and they said that uh, none of their labelling is affected. Um, that, must and, mean, that must mean that currently it's already labelled in a way that meets with the regs. Sneaky. Could be... Could be, or they switched to all Japanese whiskey, and it did go on allocation uh, late last year. Don't know. Could Let's be. 
So they've well, either they've updated been... the, the liquid or they've updated the labeling or something, but it was the master of my, my source for that quiz question. And if, if that ends up being the case, then everybody is welcome to take the point for that one as well. Um, but it was the master of malt blog that I took that one from. And specifically, ah. I think somebody uh, shared that in the Barflies page. It was one of the blog posts that I read. Master of malt, I wouldn't trust him. I wouldn't trust him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no, okay, I understand. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's interesting there as well is that um, it, it's going to just, it's going to be an issue about categorization on a website. You're going to need to work out where to put this. And if you put it underneath Japanese whiskey, you're going to have to have like whiskeys from Japan and then a subcategory of Japanese whiskey or whiskeys from Japan again or something. You're going to have to find a way to label this, these, the categorization of that, I guess. Small challenge is not a big deal. Anyway, congratulations, Eric, on your pass mark. Congratulations on a great score, Arthur, 8 out of 10. A couple of friendly low-ball questions in there for you as well, like I always do when the guests Thank came you. on. Uh, Eric, I'm going to raise a wee glass to you, my friend. By all means, stay backstage and I'll raise a glass with you and thank you off here as well. But it's always a pleasure to have you in, Eric. It's lovely to have you as part of the community, buddy. And I'm always uh, delighted when I can have you on the VPUB too. Uh, good luck with the opening up of your uh, regulations and things there and getting back to work again, my friend. And until the, the next time. Pleasure. Pleasure, Arthur. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Arthur, I knew I was going to have a bit of fun tonight. I knew I was going to get quite geeky with you tonight. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Clearly, I'm uh, most excited about, I really hope that that project, the Liquid Antiquarian, does get, get legs and traction. I hope you find a way to fund it long term. I hope you find a way to kind of keep the content going, keep the creative juices going as well. Listen, I know how much work is involved in that kind of thing. I know how tiresome it's going to be. Um, but the content is unique, and I genuinely wish you all the very, very best with it as well. Um, it's been a pleasure to get to know you uh, the last couple of weeks, and it's been a pleasure to have you behind the bar at the VPUB. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Very much so. And I, I, I will also say, and I was talking to Dave earlier on, you are the person we look to with experience on YouTube now. Um, well, and... honestly, if there's ever anything you think I can help you with in any realm, if I can't help you, I'll just say no straight away. But the YouTube whiskey world is very open. It's very collaborative. Mm. We see each other as friends. We we never compete for minutes watched. We never compete for subs. We share. Anybody in the community will say, we'll talk about that. We know that we, we need to preserve that for as long as we possibly can. It won't always be like that. would be naive to think. But right now, the YouTube community, it takes that idea of whiskey, honestly, that kind of connectedness of people bringing people together. But the YouTube community has got that lovely family feeling about it. We're very supportive of each other um, and very collaborative too. And so, yes. Well, like and Dave also said he's well up for coming on later in the year as well. Well, he knows he knows that he's on the hit list. He's been requested. No, he's, he's booked. He's booked. Yeah, he's I'm, I'm, repeatedly yeah. requested by the community as well. Uh, Dave and I just need to work together to work out what would be a nice juicy topic that would get his creative juices flowing as well and something that the community would like uh, to hear Dave talking about too so that would be super fun as well in the meantime I'll say Arthur Motley, the, the whiskey buyer the professional whiskey buyer um, <laughs> and quite fantastic whiskey geek if I'm, if I'm honest and I hope you take that in the best possible way um, thank you so much for joining us tonight and enlightening us on all, everything um, I know that there could be many, many topics in the future that you can help us with as well. So we might have you back again in the future if you're up for it, my friend. In the meantime, I'll raise a glass and say, say thank you very much. Stay backstage if you want to raise a wee glass offline, of course. And in the meantime, oh. from all the barflies, thank you so much. Cheers, Arthur. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Wonderful stuff. Let's jump in and see what the barflies are saying about... Uh, that we session with Arthur tonight. Slancher Roy and everybody from Tom Ross Fudd over in the States. Ross, always a pleasure to have you. And I love seeing you here and I love seeing your wee Elmer Fudd uh, icon as well. Good to have you. Bruno Martins in Portugal is saying, Barflies, have a nice evening to see you all next week. Sunday is the lock-in. Thanks again, Aquavite. For patrons, I'll be able to hang out with you all on Sunday night. For everybody else, I'm back to fly solo. Just myself next week has been... I think I've had three or maybe four guests on in a row now. So it's a solo session for me next week. Bruno, thank you very much, my friend. I look forward to seeing you next week. Yash is saying 380 subs, 88 subs now for the Liquid Antiquarian. Superb. The quicker that we can get them up 
over the thousand subscriber mark, the better because it unlocks all those other valuable tools inside YouTube for them as well. Um, so that's a good, good start, a wee boost for them this evening. Helen is saying, fabulous evening, Roy, with another marvellous guest and great content. See you Sunday, Slancha. Thank you, Helen. And all my very best to Andy as well. John Delacuzine is saying, lovely stream once again, John. It's always a pleasure to have you and my friend, especially when you're grateful and enjoying the content. Mark uh, Martin is saying this is a name I butchered earlier on. If you send me a wee email and tell me how you phonetically pronounce your name, it's, uh, I think it's Siman, Siman Juntak. That's the best I can do. Superb discussion. Superb evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, hopefully I'll get good at pronouncing your name in the future. Graham Fraser is saying, thanks for another fascinating evening, Roy. Graham, I'm so sorry for the 9 out of 10. I won't hold the quiz against you, saying honest. He's given me a wee wink as well. Pleasure. What Greg's Whiskey Guide and Francis saying, thanks, Arthur. Uh, and Too Slow Rob is saying, thanks, Roy and guest. Chris Pollock is saying, great VPUB. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, Roy. Um, wonderful stuff. Uh, Falsgraf is saying good night, everyone, and see you next week. See you as well, uh, Falsgraf. Chris Pollock is saying great VPUB. Have a nice weekend. I think I caught that one. He's jumping. Willie Dollar is saying another superb guest. Now on 391 subs. This is exactly the stuff we love, says Jimmy Leg. Can't wait for Sunday. Take care of your spine. My back is almost back to normal, but as I'm speed sitting here tonight, you might have seen me shifting around. I think I always do anyway, but it is getting a wee bit uncomfortable. Donner Pass Whiskey is saying good to have you watch on the replay, but looking forward to being here Sunday. Looking forward to welcoming you Sunday as well, Tim. Wonderful stuff to everybody. I'm going to uh, encourage you all to go along and give the Liquid Antiquarian a wee. Uh, sub uh, honestly, if you don't enjoy the content that they're putting out there, you can unsubscribe and you can go back and tell me that I'm talking nonsense. But honestly, watch it. It is right up the Whiskey Geeks Street. Hey, I think you'll love it. Andrew Butler is saying the Nika labels are okay, but they have clarified ones that won't qualify as Japanese whiskey. Interesting, the Nika, which the Nika from the barrel labels. If that if there's anything wrong with that question, of course, you get the point free of charges. Yours to take to the bank is no problem at all. James McGoran saying great night as always. Uh, good night, folks. Well, I'll raise this wee glass. I'll say uh, to those patrons that I'll be hanging out with on Sunday. I look forward to that. And for everyone, I look forward to being back with you a week from tonight. Thanks for hanging out for another long, long, long session again tonight. But it's the VPUB. It's just the way of it. It's lockdown. It's just the way it's going to be. I don't think I'm ever going to be that good at running to a schedule. In the meantime, let me say thanks to my guests, Eric, for his uh, participation in his at Spaceside, and Arthur Motley as well for coming along and sharing all his insight tonight. And everybody, all you dearly loved, beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies, I look forward to seeing you all a week from tonight. Slanjava, thank you. Mm -hmm.